Welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Today, Paul is talking with Irvin Laszlo. Twice nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, Professor Laszlo is the prolific author or co-author of 54 books translated into 24 languages and about 400 research papers and articles. A resident of Italy, he is the longtime editor of the acclaimed international periodical World Futures, the Journal of General Evolution. Founder of two international think tanks, Club of Budapest and General Evolution Research Group, he is also the founder and director of the Laszlo Institute of New Paradigm Research, a global think tank dedicated to exploring and expanding the frontiers of science and consciousness. Hi, everybody. I'd like to begin this podcast by saying thank you all for joining me and for buying products from our sponsors, which really helps me have enough income to keep the podcast going. As I'm sure you can imagine, it does take a lot of my time. And I'd also like to thank you and give you a great big hug through the airways for sharing the podcast with other people so we can grow it together and spread the word. If you enjoy it, I'm sure you'd like others to enjoy it. Today, I'm really excited to introduce my guest today, actually two guests today. But I'm going to start by saying that in my library, there's a literal storehouse of books of the greatest geniuses in many areas of science, health, religion, metaphysics, and more. In my collection of excellent books are about a dozen books by one of my heroes, Irvin Laszlo. He's a systems theorist and expert in many different fields of science, has twice been selected for the Nobel Peace Prize, has been awarded multiple honorary PhDs, and has been the recipient of numerous prestigious awards worldwide for his groundbreaking work. Irvin Laszlo is one of the most well-informed, spiritually evolved thinkers of our day and is highly respected by the greatest minds in science today. He has published, contributed to, and served as editor for one, over 100 books and numerous scientific papers, probably hundreds actually. In his newest book, Reconnecting to the Source, The New Science of Spiritual Experience, How It Can Change You and How It Can Transform the World, uh, I think... Irvin really shares a lot of great solutions for what we all need to address today. Of all the people in the world that I felt could shed some light on how to deal with the real challenges we face in the world today, it's Irvin Laszlo. But let me point out that this interview was recorded before the coronavirus pandemic hit, so pay very close attention when he speaks about viral epidemics and related issues. I think you'll be quite surprised. Unfortunately, Irvin was in Italy when we did this interview, and it was late at night for him, so he can only give us about 35 minutes of his time. So in this special interview, I invited James Phelps, dean of my PPS Success Mastery Program and manager of the podcast, to engage in dialogue with me on each of the questions I asked and Irvin's answers. I think you'll be very impressed with the depth and clarity of Irvin Laszlo's wisdom and his suggestions for solving the challenges we face in the world today, and I hope you enjoy the dialogue James and I share in response to what Irvin proposes we do to bring about world healing today. This is one that is sure to make you think deeply about how we're living on this planet and what we can all do to ensure positive change in the world. Enjoy. Well, welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check today. Uh, today, I'm super excited to have really one of my heroes to uh, d share with us today. Professor Irvin Laszlo is somebody who I've studied for many years. I've read many of his books. In fact, I have a whole section in my library of Irvin Laszlo books. There's a great series called the Legacy Series on Gaia TV with Irvin Laszlo, which I highly recommend. It's absolutely beautiful. Professor Laszlo has edited, authored, and contributed to over 100 books in many languages. I found his teachings deeply enriching, enlightening, honest, loving, and he leaves me with a great sense of reassurance that my own mystical experiences are congruent with the wisdom of a great mind. Professor Irvin Laszlo, welcome to Living 4D with Paul Check. Paul Check, it's very good to be here. And please, I'm Irvin for you. Please, let's, yes, let's thank talk you. like this informally. Yeah, great. You know, for our listeners that may not be familiar with you, can you just give us a brief encapsulation of your journey from being a concert pianist to one of the most respected systems theorists and scientists in the world? Boy, first of all, I don't really like so much to talk about myself, and that's a very difficult topic. I once had a <laughs> book about uh, uh, my experiences. It's a whole book, about 300 pages, 
and I don't repeat it now, that was 10 years ago. But uh, let me yeah. just say that it's the key element is curiosity. And the, ten, Excellent. the sense of mission also, both of them. I want to know, and I have a feeling that I ought to know that there is, there is something behind it. That there is, I can enrich myself and perhaps enrich my world around me uh, by finding out more things. So uh, yes. that's a one-way street, you know. Once you, you get into that, it's very difficult to do something else to, to come back. I was a concert pianist, and as a child already, I had play, performed concerts. And while I was playing the piano, particularly in public, I've had experiences, which today we would call the, the aesthetic experience, almost a mysti mystical experience, but it's really a sense of oneness, a sense of floating together in, with the music in another space, another time. <clears throat> and yeah, I that's was really interested cool. to find out what this experience is. Is the science tell us something about it? And I started reading and attending university as a while, I, even while I was doing concert uh, concert tours as a, as a young man. And then I, I got into this. I wrote uh, a book which I saw for myself, by more or less by mistake, by chance. An editor saw my notes and wanted to publish it. And then I realized for the first time that perhaps what I'm writing and thinking could be of interest to other people too. And then I got more serious. I mean, I was invited to Yale University, even though I didn't have any 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 formal degree or, or, or training in philosophy or in science. My degree uh, was in music. But uh, they invited me on the basis of my, my first two books, and then I accepted, and then I got into an academic career. And from there on, I got involved more and more and more in research and became freelance then after a while. And so this is where I am now. Well, that's absolutely amazing. And thank you for sharing that. And the legacy series on Gaia gives people a chance to get more depth and connection to what you've just summarized. So for I would encourage everybody to watch that series on Gaia. So James, fun to share this with you, man. Yeah, likewise. I'm glad to be here. This is uh I don't think we've done this before. This is great. No, no, we, we should, though. It's great. Yeah. And, um, you know, what we're doing with you guys is is sharing some thoughts and feelings as Irvin Laszlo is an incredible human being and very, very accomplished in many levels. He's been given, yeah. I don't know, he's been given too many honorary doctorates to count. And, yeah. um, you know, he, he talks a little bit about some neat stuff as we go along here. But uh, one of the yeah. things that, I found fascinating is is uh, his comment about curiosity, you know, yeah. and it's curiosity that drives me to do everything. I mean, yeah. the th thing I find, and I'm, I'm sure you too, the more you know, the more yeah. you realize you don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yes. But the more you actually study, real study, not just intellectual memorization of words, so cut and paste type stuff, but yeah. the more you really study and get into things, the more you learn the more dots connect but the yeah. bigger and deeper your questions get yeah have you found that definitely um and and in all phases too right uh, of your life right the, yeah i started off as a philosopher myself yes and that's certainly you know a big part of what it means to be a philosopher but you know even outside of that once i get into marketing you know, i don't know that people think about marketing in this way but that you know there's a deep curiosity it, a psychological curiosity about why people purchase, why people are interested in in what we do, yeah. and and that curiosity is always driven, you know, the marketing side of the stuff that I do for the Czech Institute as well. So I think, you know, and, and the other part, you know, this is this is interesting. So Aristotle, you know, asked, "What is the essence of uh, you know a human? What does it mean to be human?" And yeah, it, it's it's to ask the question, "Why?" You yeah. know, curiosity is sort of a deep fundamental part of who we are. I, I use a little system that I've used for a long time in my life since I was young. Um, it's the, I call it the four W's and an H. Hmm. Who, what, why, where, when, and how. Yeah. I'm always wanting to know who, whose idea or who is the source of the idea. Yeah. What is it that they're actually hmm. saying? Yeah. Why does it work? How does it work? Yeah. And when is it best to apply it? Yeah. 
And that's been kind of a guiding structure I've used to build the entire Institute education program. Yeah. I, you know, one of the things that I think was fascinating about him, and, and you know, the listeners will probably hear this from his story, right, is that he didn't start off with any formal training. It was his, it was his curiosity that guided him mm-hmm. through his life, and he mm-hmm. let, he trusted that curiosity yeah. to guide him in the right ways. And and when he did, well, what happened? This whole field opened up for him. This yeah. whole line multiple of, fields. Yeah, I mean, he's right? well established in. Systems theory, quantum physics, consciousness studies. Yeah. He's an inventor. He's a scientist, a researcher. I mean, this guy's got his hand, and he's, an, he's, yeah. he's like 85 or 86 years old, and he's still yeah. rocking it, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So he's a great inspiration. One of the things mm-hmm. that I love too is, um, you know, he started off as a musician, and there's so many amazingly enlightened musicians out there. Yeah. And I think that. You know, when I do drum circles and healing ceremonies and, you know, practice my own rattling, drumming, chanting, Tibetan bowls, I I find that it's, you know, if you can relax into it, it's as powerful as psychedelic medicines, Mm. you know, and it's very opening and very beautiful. And I've been blessed to, it's only been in the last couple of years that this started happening to me, probably the last year, I begin being in meditation and hearing music Mm. and said to my soul, is that the music of the spheres? And my soul said, yes. Mm. And it's, I don't know, maybe it's just, you know, I'm getting deeper and deeper into my own spiritual practice and all of a Mm. sudden I'm beginning to hear the sound of the universe and it's just mind blowing. It reminds me of listening to Hilary Stagg (laughs) is the closest person I could say, like what, what I hear yeah, sounds just like Hilary Stagg, the famous harpist, and wow. and I love Hilary Stagg's music. Mm-hmm. If you're not familiar with Hilary Stagg, check him out. Yeah, but um, also I wanted to mention one of my favorite all time books. Since people are always wanting to know what I like, mm. is a book called The Music Lesson by Victor Wooten, the famous jazz guitarist. So, mm. if you want a mind blowing book that really is not only amazing from a musician, but teaches you what spirituality really is and how it can be used in your life on a daily basis. The music lesson is phenomenal. Yeah. I, you know, I think it's, maybe one doesn't start to hear this until you get a little bit later in life, but that, that there are, there's music in almost anything and everything that you do. Yeah. And when you learn to hear it and relax into it, it's this amazing experience. And so for my experience, you know, running, you know, I, what I would find is some of the most therapeutic uh, and meditative runs that I would have are ones where I would start to hear a music uh, that's created from my breathing mm. and my feet on the ground mm-hmm. and all of that. And and when I would hear that and be in sync with that, then I would have these, because it, it, this amazing meditative experience for eight to 10, 15 miles. Yeah, flow state. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah. Well, I'm excited to get into it. So what we're yeah. going to do, you guys, is we're going to share our experience of Irvin Laszlo's responses to my questions and hopefully you'll enjoy the dialogue and um, and we'll get a more comprehensive, rich experience uh, because we'll all get to be involved. And uh, I think, you know, I wanted to do this with James because Irvin Laszlo is so deep and so amazing. We wanted to be able to just share our love and our impressions and experiences with all of you. So let's see what he has to say next. Yeah, let's do it. Irvin, I've titled this podcast, The Future of Man, because I've spent enough time studying your books and your video appearances where you express your concerns and the possibilities we have. So without a long accounting of all the areas of earth systems, social systems, education systems, et cetera, that are dangerously uh, crippled, and I'm confident most of my listeners are aware of all these things, I'd love it if you could share what you feel are the greatest challenges and possibilities for these challenges uh, that humans have for each other and for the future of our world and, 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 and life on this planet? Well, the challenge is there that we have stepped out of the zone of influence, of the, the, in, the internal instinctive inspiration of our natural sense of who we are and what nature is around us. We have stepped out of it and we have created our own world, an artificial world. And in many respects, this world does not agree to or move within the bounds of what is permissible, what is possible, what is stable. 
what is sustainable in nature. The cosmos is a very strong guide and strong teacher, but we have to be able to listen to it. <clears throat> and I feel the challenges come because some, God knows, a few hundred years ago, we have started operating as though we were separate from this world, as though we could create our own environment, our own future. And in many respects, this is, of course, an exercise in freedom, and it's laudable, and it's marvelous. But it also has to be aware. It has to be conscious, aware of what the limits are, what the bounds are. These bounds are very generous, but it's not everything is possible. So I think we are seeing now the consequences on nature, on society, on each other, <clears throat> of having moved into a, a synthetic world where we are guided by all the, our strong wish to, for power, for money, for dominance, for winning in competitions, and so on. And this is moving us away from, out of the harmony with nature, out of the coherence of the laws, with the laws that govern development in the world. So that's the challenge. Here we are. We have got to find our way back because the way we are going now is moving in a bad direction, is moving us into increasing instabilities. Everything we see today even outbreaks of viruses <clears throat> are a sign, an indication, and perhaps a warning that we have got to mend our ways and work and live in a way which is consistent with the world around us. It's a very generous world. Many things are, are, we can do, but we have to know that what the information that is in this world, what the information which is in us, is our guide. It's a GPS. And it's in us, instead of just following blindly ahead, competing with others for money, for power, for position, for privilege. We have got to know that besides all that, beyond all that, there is a higher aim, a harmony with the world, and a oneness with the world around us, and a co-evolving toward these levels of consciousness, which are there to be, uh, to be had, to be evolved. We, are, we can move toward this. Some of us are moving toward this. But as a society, we are moving in a bad direction right now. And there are indications that there's a change coming, that we have got to promote that change. That's our role. That's our mission. Well, that's beautiful. Hi, everybody. I hope you're enjoying the interview. I suspect it's getting to be crystal clear that we must all work together now without delay to heal the social, cultural, religious, and political wounds we all carry, or we'll never be able to do the world work that demands our attention. If we don't, as Irvin Laszlo lucidly explains, the sixth extinction will come to fruition, and it's not a pretty picture. There's no better place to start than by consuming high-quality certified organic foods and drinks, and Organifi has done all the hard work for you. They have many easy-to-use, high-quality superfood products and protein sources so you can get your energy and mental clarity up to potential so you can live fully and contribute to your personal healing and world work with zest. Yes! Go to Organifi.com, that's O-R-G-A-N-I-F-I.com, and at checkout, use the code capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K, 20, to get your 20% discount on any of those products that you'd like. To get to know Drew Canoli, the founder of Organifi, listen to my Living 4D with Paul Check podcast number 64, Drew Canoli, UBU. I think when you get to know the man behind the products, you'll see why we align in our values and why I really believe in what he's doing. And oh, by the way, his book, UBU, is very good too. As always, I'd love your feedback on your experiences with Organifi products, and so would Drew. Well, that was a really interesting response from Irvin on, you know, what are the challenges and the positives we face for each other in the world right now, you know, and yeah. it's, a, I think one of the key points that he made there that really rings true with me is that we've stepped out of nature into an artificial world of our own creation. Yeah. And, you know, when you, when you look at mind and philosophy of mind, mind is something that 
um, can exist, you know, without a physical reality. You know, mm. ideas, information doesn't even require space. Quantum physics has shown that. Yeah. You, 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 can, you have non-local information. It's right. zipped. You call it a zip file that goes down to zero. Mm. But the point I'm leading to is that when we actually start believing ideas yeah. more than we believe our experience or our ideas take us away from the roots of what makes life, mm. you know, like we've all got smartphones and we've got, you know, eco powered cars or battery powered cars and we've got, you know, biohacking gadgets for every damn thing. Mm. And, you know, but the reality of it is, is that if we really took the time to be in nature and to ask ourselves the questions, is things like scientifically validated processed foods mm -hmm. really working for me? What does my yeah. body tell me? You know, yeah. are all these drugs that are scientifically validated really working for any of us? Yeah. You know, yeah, there's some good drugs that do help, but they never help in absence of reconnecting to what your dream is. Yeah. Am I moving too much or too little? Yeah. Am I eating real food? Am I putting my hands in the farmers that are caring for the planet? Or am I just shopping for food like gasoline and not paying any attention to the fact that that's destroying the planet? And am I getting enough rest from the activity of the workaday world and the constant incessant activity of most people's own minds to just step outside of it? And when you step outside your mind in meditation, you notice it's like a perpetual thinking machine. You just mm. watch it run. Yeah. So there's my point. The mind can run whether or not the body's coming along. Mm. And when you look at the science of memetics, which is very coupled in with the concepts of, of brainwashing, you know, uh, Richard Dawkins says, memes have no respect for genes. Mm. And so the example I give in my PPS Success Mastery uh, Lesson uh, 2, it I believe is Self-Mastery Lesson 2, yeah. on, on how yeah. the mind is programmed yeah. and yeah. how to unprogram it is, you know, let's think of a meme that everyone's familiar with. Mm. Things go better with Coke. Mm. Do they? Yeah. Do they really? Yeah. And so think of all the little slogans that have been planted in our heads that are memes yeah. that have no respect for our genes. Yeah. Right? We need to go to war, mm -hmm. right? We didn't need to go to war in Vietnam. We didn't mm -hmm. need to drop the the nuclear a nuclear bomb on Japan. They'd already they'd already mm -hmm. given up. They'd already signaled that they were yeah. they they'd already given a cease and desist, a ceasefire. But the mm -hmm. Americans dropped it just to prove a point. So you see, when we when we lose awareness of when our mind is actually leading us to make choices and live in ways that are ultimately destructive for the planet, for each other, and for ourselves, then we're in a very dangerous uh, situation. And I think that uh, that's, that's the key thing that's taking us out of the earth plane. Yeah. And, and that's the fascinating sort of depth, depth to his point, right? Was it would be easy to think when he's talking about separation from nature is separating from the nature external to us. Mm -hmm. But it's a separation, I think you would say, from ourselves as well in the ways that you were just talking about. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I take it that this is part of what you're getting at when you're trying to teach people about the last four doctors is a uh, reconnection with yourself. And, yeah. and by reconnecting to yourself, reconnecting to the world at large at the same time. Yes. You know, pe people, the ego is a dangerous thing because it creates this real illusion of solidity, hmm. right? Like I'm separate from James. It looks like I'm separate from you. You're sitting hmm. on the other side of the table. We're having a conversation, but you're breathing the same air I am. Hmm. You're drinking water from the same planet I am. Yeah. You're eating food that came from outside you and hmm. enters into you to become the body that you wear. Yeah. We're, we're all dependent upon the sun and its light for everything from food to warmth to vitamin D to uh, a positive psychological state. I mean, anybody that's been in Denmark in the winter knows how important the sun is. <laughs> yeah. Or Sweden yeah. or any of those Scandinavian countries. But the point I'm making is, is, is that we are entirely permeable. Hmm. And, and what, who we think we are, like 
Mm-hmm. If I say to my students all the time, if you could download every idea you have in your head into a computer and it could sort through to identify the ones that were authentically of your own making, how many of those ideas that encapsulate what you think of as your own thoughts would actually be yours? Yeah. Most people are right when they say not more than about 2%, yeah. right? So the point I'm making is even what we think of as our own minds is potentially 98% Mom's ideas, dad's ideas, school teachers' ideas, society's ideas, television, radio, newspapers, yeah. magazines, other people, other and and the problem is we believe a lot of that stuff's true. But you know, yeah. it's like Chinese whispers. One yeah. person reads a research study, they tell someone else it's true, they believe it, they cite it, yeah. but they've never even looked at it. And none of them looks to see if the study design is even effective. Yeah. Or if if the criteria by which they came to the conclusion is even logical or rational. So there's, you see how most of us are really thinking paper boats. We Mm -hmm. don't realize that most of what we tangibly use to make decisions is really on shaky ground. And then when our life starts to fall apart, what do we do? We run to somebody else for their ideas and they give us more of their paper boats. And so, Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, you know, as I shared in my pain teacher series, pain is there to guide you back into yourself and to right. make you aware. And, and you know, Laszlo is doing a great job of talking about some of the issues that are creating pain for us. And as you know, I talk about the echo concept, energy, chemistry, hydration, and organisms. Mm-hmm. And I say, look, the energy that you cultivate through eating and bringing things into your body like breath Mm. is coming from outside you. Um, Mm. The chemistry of your body is largely dependent on what you eat and drink. It's coming Mm. from outside you. If you're you're not well hydrated, you're in trouble, but where's the water coming from and how clean is it? Yeah. And then organisms, we eat organisms, but the echo concept is means whatever you put out comes back. If you say hello to the Grand Canyon, it says hello back to you. If you Mm. say you're a real ass, it says you're a real ass. <laughs> so what I'm trying to share here is that all the choices we're making, conscious or unconscious, that impact the environment. Hmm. It may look like someone's cutting the rainforest down to grow more cotton and, and hmm. industrial crops, but hmm. we don't realize we're cutting the rainforest of ourselves down. Yeah. We may be poisoning the waters, moving huge containers of oil everywhere, but we don't need the oil And when we're killing off the sea life and the Great Barrier Reef and everything else, we're killing ourselves. We're killing the ocean of ourselves. Yeah. So I think we all need to remember that we are contributing to the Mm. echo and getting back to yourself. And my observation brings you back into touch with the essence of who and what you really are. Mm. And when you realize that you are the world, Mm. then it's only, you know, common sense that we better take care of the world and each other. Yeah, yeah. And I, I would imagine, too, you as a therapist, uh, I probably, I, I don't know how many cases you see where the, the real underlying problem is a lack of connection, a lack of connection with yourself, a lack of connection with your parents, your children, your spouse, your family, your friends, uh, and then a lack of connection with, you know, the world at large. But you have breaks in either one of those, and that's a cause of major sorts of stress. Almost all disease is basically a lack of connection. Yeah. Right. Because really, what is disease? It's the result of the actions we've made. Mm. What are actions? The result of choices. What are choices? The results of beliefs. Yeah. Where do we get our beliefs from? Mostly other people, as we just discussed. Yeah. So it's all disconnection. I mean, healing really is getting honest with yourself, which is why I did a series on my YouTube channel called The Fastest Way to Health. And the first thing I tell people, the fastest way to health is to quit bullshitting yourself. (laughs) And we have to stop bullshitting ourselves. 5G phone systems might make your phone go faster, but if you Mm. think that's enhancing your life, you're bullshitting yourself. You're not paying attention. So without a long laundry list of all the things that we're bullshitting ourselves on, uh, that are supposed to make our life easier, it's not making our life easier. Yeah. And even if it was just us, that would be okay. But when we're doing things that are destroying nature yeah. so that we can get faster video downloads, then we're disconnecting from yeah. what Jung would call the self, capital S-E-L-F, which is mm. all that which supports you, yeah. right? The little self is an organism that is dependent upon the self. Yeah. So one of the things that he that he mentioned was, you know, 
the cosmos is our guide, but we have to mm. listen. Yeah. And um, if if we realize that we are the cosmos, and and you know, uh, the fa famous uh, physicist uh, John Wheeler, you know, he he really showed scientifically that the universe is in a self. Uh, relational feedback loop and we are like neurons in the mind of the universe everything we're experiencing it's experiencing mm. so we're like the eyes and ears and the mouth and the nose um, and the senses of yeah. the universe at this level of reality yeah so when i think a lot of the problems that we're having with all the medical drug use and addictions and you know and look at the the, the huge surge now with psychedelics reoccurring because what do they do? They bring you right back into touch with Earth yeah. and with your environment and with yourself. But they also, you know, go down in the dungeon and bring your garbage right up where you have to look at it. Yeah. And most people just run from it and call it a bad trip and blame on the drug. But they don't realize the drugs are just amplifiers. You know, they're, LSD doesn't add anything to your brain. Mm. Neither does mushrooms, neither does ayahuasca. What they mm. do is they bring spiritual forces in that allow your unconscious to be brought up in images and experiences while you're conscious. So you can see, in other words, you know, we can't hear the cockroaches and the mice and the insects in the house right now, but if you amplified the sound of this house by 1 million times, mm. you'd probably be able to pick them right out. Yeah. And so psychedelics are amplifiers. And so mm. people are actually desperately seeking reconnection, which I think is critical before we, you know, completely destroy life and each other. Yeah. And just one final point about this section. Uh, um, I don't know if our listeners caught this, but Paul and I are recording this during the whole shelter in place order right. from the COVID. Uh -huh. and, uh, but you recorded the interview with uh, Ir Irvin um, yeah. well before this happened. Well before this and COVID, COVID, uh, coronavirus yeah. epidemic and he's warning right there right exactly but he's not warning like bill gates after filing a patent on the coronavirus yeah. Yeah. he's com he's warning us because he understands how nature works and that whenever there's rot yeah. then the decomposers come yeah yeah you know? so yeah. it's it's um you know he also says change is coming and yeah. and, and and i would say now you know as you said, he was talking about viral epidemics, and he said mm. change is coming. Well, change is here. Yeah, and 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 you know, it, it can either scare the hell out of you, or you can say, "Wow, I really have time now to, to listen to intelligent people and pay attention and yeah. water my plants and hang out with my kids and love my pets." And yeah. you know, it doesn't cost a lot of money to do that, right? Yeah. The beautiful is we're all in it together, right? Yeah. yeah. If if we're Lacking money, let, well, let's be lacking money together. Yeah. It usually stimulates creativity, right? Yeah. If you're yeah. hungry, you learn to hunt. Mm -hmm. And um, if you need a good job and you don't have the skills, then you go hunting for the new skills that have yeah. the uh, key to the door that you want to open. Yeah. And, and we're all in a situation right now where we can get still enough to listen to the music of the universe. And, and what I tell yeah. people that, have a hard time with that i say i'll tell you how to hear the music of the universe hmm. you want a tip for hearing the music of the universe lay down hmm. get real quiet hmm. and listen to your own heartbeat mm -hmm. and if you can't hear it just get a stethoscope <laughs> and wear it yeah. and you will hear the drummer that's drumming you into existence yeah and who it is that's holding the drumstick and the drum is the great mother the yeah. cosmos so we have all the music right inside of us. It's what makes us. It's what makes mm -hmm. us breathe. We're only breathing because the universe is breathing. We only have a heartbeat because there's a rhythm to the universe. We have rhythms within us because they're expressions of the rhythms within the universe. And when we're sick, we're in a state of disease. Yeah. We're not listening to our heart. We're not paying attention to our breathing. We're not establishing rhythms such as sleep-wake cycles, eating mm. meals adequately to keep our blood sugar level and eating real food. And one of the things that brings up before we jump to his next point in the interview is that um, we, we all have a chance to center ourselves mm. and, and get clear on what, what is, what is sustainable? Yeah. What do we all need together? Right. Mm -hmm. Um, we don't need segregation. 
Mm-hmm. And we don't need uh, billionaires that are trying to control the population and act like kings and emperors from days gone by, I hope. Mm-hmm. But what we do need to do is say, you know, look, we're in this together. Mm-hmm. We're all the children of the universe and the children of Mother Earth. And we have enough resources to go around. We yeah. really need to start spending less money on defense budgets and more money on true connection and support for each other and say, okay, these people over here need some yeah. food. Yeah. Uh, we need some such and such resources. And if we start sharing with each other yeah. and just say, okay, let's just make sure everybody mm. can enjoy life, then I mean, it would be a radical re- restructuring of the whole capitalist mm-hmm. system. Mm-hmm. But I think that's got to happen or we're mm-hmm. going to capitalize ourselves right into non-existence. Yeah, well, and this is part of the point about uh, cooperation versus competition. Exactly. Right, and that that we, in many ways, came out of cooperation. And so to separate ourselves in the way that we do through making our lives about competition, yeah. or, again, it's another way of separating ourselves from ourselves. Yeah, you know, Fred Allen Wolf says something really cool. Sex is the future calling you into your potential. Mm. Um, and how does that relate to cooperation? Well, hopefully each of us is the product of people that are making love, which is a mm. cooperative effort. Yeah. Right. So we did begin as a cooperative effort. It yeah. takes two to do that tango. And, you know, the more love there is between the parents, usually the better the child fares in the world. Yeah. And if we realize we're all in a cooperative effort, we're making love. And if we're not paying attention, then it's shitty sex mm. or shitty love. But if we pay attention to how we can touch each other and help each other and nurture that which supports us, i.e. the planet, yeah. and come back in line with universal principles and values, we'll be okay. But if we don't, there's a real fear real challenge facing us and that is to the degree that we create and live an illusion Mm. we have to carry the responsibility of energizing and maintaining it ourselves because it's Mm. not congruent with the laws of the universe or the principles of nature Mm. all the competition and you know bullshitting people lying and cheating and selling uh, falsely and manipulating and you know classic marketing scams and Mm. all the stuff we see in the world those are all illusions that that have to be maintained by the people creating them and those that are silly enough to buy into them. Mm. But ultimately, you know, the universe is a self-sustaining mechanism. And and yeah. if we keep throwing it out of balance, she's going to write herself, which is what we see going on right now. Yeah. And it, it's it's writing itself with radical weather patterns, it's writing itself with viral epidemics no matter how they came they're here whether it's engineered or whether it's patented by bill gates or whether it's the flu virus it's here Mm. but it interestingly is only a problem for the people that are living out of tune but the people that are in tune are in harmony with the laws of the universe and therefore they are supported by the universe yeah and this is that moment of awakening it is let's see what he's got to say next because i love his answers All right. Hi, everybody. How much better do you imagine you'd look, feel, and perform each day if you really understood how to eat, move your body, work with your natural sleep-wake cycle, better manage your stress, detoxify yourself, and heal your gut naturally? I can tell you for sure. I developed our Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 1 program specifically for students of the Czech Institute that were coming for advanced professional training in holistic lifestyle coaching, but were clearly not healthy enough to lead by example. I'd see people come that were overweight, out of shape, and often very unhealthy, and then show up for the next, more advanced course several months later looking just as bad. Clearly, they were not applying the teachings to themselves. I could not stand for that. My belief is that a holistic lifestyle coach must lead by example and be authentic. So I created Holistic Lifestyle Coach Level 1 online for everyone and shared the key principles in an easy-to-understand format that anyone from 12-year-old kids to the elderly could understand. I also made it mandatory for all students wanting to take HLC2, our professional lifestyle coach training, to complete HLC1 training for up to six months. 
I was overjoyed and truly amazed at the changes I saw in my students. I've seen people that showed up to other courses unhealthy and obese lose as much as 90 pounds and end up looking and feeling great just by applying the teachings nutritionist Angie Check and I now offer you at a huge discount. We really want to help you look and feel your best. You can get this whole course online now at chekinstitute.com forward slash HLC1 online. That's checkinstitute.com forward slash HLC1 online. Listeners to Living 4D with Paul Check get a $100 discount. We are motivated to help all of you look and feel your best during this crazy period with the coronavirus and all the issues going on. On checkout, use the code L4DHLC, no caps. That code again is L4DHLC, no caps. This is sure to be the best investment you've ever made in yourself or your family. And as always, we'd love your feedback. Enjoy. We live in a world that is steeped in both religious programming and the division that, that, ha- that the religious programming has caused for quite some time. We live in a world in which there's a great divide among scientific materialists who still hang on to Newtonian thinking, and those such as yourself, William A. Tiller, Fred Allen Wolf, Dean Radin, Claude Swanson, David Bohm, Gary Schwartz, Edgar Mitchell, Arthur M. Young, and many others that see a unity between source and the sum of its parts. We live in a world where many corporate leaders and political leaders like Donald Trump seem to feel that the world is just a bunch of matter and that nature is ours to conquer and do what we want with and have little concern for the consequences. The same kind of division can easily be seen in issues of the brain and consciousness and the views on people have on what happens when we die. In science, there's a saying that the old guard at the top has to die before new ideas can be embraced and emerge. My question for you is, Do we have time to wait for those in powerful positions with limited dangerous viewpoints to die before we reach a consensus on what we are, what our relationship to the earth and the cosmos is, and what must be done before we reach a tipping point in this sixth mass extinction? Well, we have reached various tipping points already, and there's no question that we can just sit back and wait. That's the worst thing we could possibly do. If, if we join the negative trends in a way in the short term, curiously enough, paradoxically, we are enforcing a crisis and that will move us forward, but at a great danger, at a danger possibly even of our extinction. So it's better, it's safer to already move beyond the tipping point, the current, all, all these questions that you don't note yourself is all these pe- people who are my heroes as well, my colleagues. I love to work with them, I, and we are developing a new paradigm, a new way of thinking and feeling and understanding. And that is, I think, the future. The future of my men, the future of mankind, depends on absorbing this new paradigm, this new way of looking at ourselves. It's coming. Yes. It's there. But we have got to get into it consciously, listen to ourselves, and move forward. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, James, as you can see, I was asking about religious programming and division, scientific materialism, and the separation that creates um, the corporate leaders and the destruction of nature, and um, the issues of, you know, the brain as the source of consciousness, which is, you know, uh, again, an expression of scientific materialism. Mm. And, uh, you know, the big question I asked him at the end is, do we have time to wait for all the leaders to die before the paradigm shifts? Yeah. You know, because that's been the problem in in science, particularly in in some ways philosophy, but in all the Mm. major fields of study, because we are, uh, our world is, is really, our education comes largely by way of academic institutions where people have stakes in their positions and stakes in their belief system. I mean, Mm. all you got to do is look at, the how the quantum physics revolution really created a huge dichotomy in science and to this very day we still have people clinging to newtonian science when Mm. it's like a hundred and something years blown out of the water yeah and though we've realized it applies to the material realm where Mm. you know if a cue ball hits the billiard Mm. balls they Mm. move right Mm. so there's a cause and effect at this level but that's not what's happening behind it right 
So, you know, what, what I really loved was, was his response. And, and, you know, his first thing is we can't sit back and wait. We can't wait for the, for the old guard to die because mm-hmm. they're, they're, you know, look at Donald Trump. He's, mm-hmm. by all intents and purposes, is an elderly man, but he's got mm-hmm. some really rigid, dangerous ideas based on separation, building walls, drilling for mm-hmm. oil, fracking, mm-hmm. getting rid of the EPA, the Environmental mm-hmm. Protection Agency, Yep. And does all this so beautifully behind the smoke screen of a coronavirus. He's passing all sorts of laws to make all this sort of stuff happen. We've got 5G phone systems being installed in schools everywhere while people are at home. And there's no kids in schools. People are often not aware of that. Yeah. And, you know, so, you know, I think his key word is we cannot just sit back and wait. Yeah. And and really being passive is uh, is is really voting. Yeah. If you're not participating in a democracy and you're not sharing your opinion and living in accordance with that opinion, then you are part of the problem. Yeah. And you know, the first person that hurts is the individual that's participating that way. It's their health that's going to get squashed. It's their finances that are getting, you know, tormented. It's mm-hmm. their uh adhering to the a uh, Darwinian idea of of only the strong survive that leads a lot of people in depression, because yeah. you know a lot of people out there aren't really equipped for the intensity of the kind of the corporate world. And you mm. know, I make a living, as you know, working with burned out corporate executives yeah. that suffer from addictions and frustrations, and spend most of their money on trying to figure out how to get their health and their sanity back. Yeah. So uh, you know, these are are very very real, and I think. Mm. He's right. We do need a new paradigm. That's really what I've devoted my whole life to. Yeah. Holism. The paradigm is holism. Yeah. Right? Don't you think? Oh, for sure. Right? I mean, that's the the 180 degrees from where we are now, right? Uh, now we're in this mode of separation. Separation yeah. from ourselves, from society, from each other, from nature. And uh, that's what's gotten us into this place. And the thing is, there's there's another real point. Hmm. We're in this mode of separation. We Mm. see the statistics on the rates of depression and anxiety Mm. and suicide due to the extensive use of Facebook and social media. Mm. We we have the illusion of connection, Mm. but the reality is that separation is an illusion, and it's another illusion that the universe will not provide the energy to maintain. Mm. What is depression? It's a lack of energy. It's a lack of vitality. It's a lack of a sense of connection. Whenever your sense of vitality reaches the point at which your own biological systems seem threatened, you have a massive cortisol response. Mm. Your body's in a fight or flight reaction. Yeah. And if you look at the values memes, once you get down in Claire Graves model mm. into beige where you're mm. sick or you're unhealthy, yeah. you become like a child that's completely self-centered. You yeah. need the support of other people. You mm. can't feed yourself. You can't mm. pay your bills. You're stuck mm. in bed. Mm. So the illusion that we're trying to maintain yeah. that's separating us is actually bringing us into a crisis of self where we can no longer effectively participate yeah. in a new paradigm and in in in, in being democratic. And while this is all going on, the same forces that are creating all these mediums such as Facebook and Google, are also um, taking away our freedom of speech. I mean, this whole coronavirus thing has been an interesting experiment in freedom of speech. Yeah. My video was put up on Facebook by one of my clients, and she said within a few minutes it was taken down. Mm-hmm. I've had many, many of my friends and fellow podcasters and leaders in their various circles have the same thing happen. They share mm-hmm. a little truth, and boom, it's gone. Yeah. So... You know, the, the, the point I'm making is that the same companies that have deemed themselves our parents, mm. right? I watched, a, 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 I watched Mark Zuckerberg, the mm. founder of Facebook, yeah. and it was a documentary and they showed him, you know, getting deposed and, you know, mm. asking questions. Mm. And he kept saying, well, we think mm. that the community should be this way. We mm. So I'm watching this guy and he's, playing moses he yeah. he's writing the ten commandments yeah and bill gates is writing the ten commandments bill gates is saying well, you have to have these vaccinations right when, you know, without getting into the conspiracy behind all that 
we have now got people playing God, yeah. and everyone's laying around being passive about it. Yeah. When you turn your life over, and you get sucked into these things, and you know, I interviewed Nile um, uh, near Ayal, mm. who wrote the book Hooked, and laid it right in front of you. This is how mm. they get you hooked. Yeah. Right, and then he had his own problems with getting hooked, and wrote Indistractable to say yeah. this is how you get unhooked. Yeah. Right. So the, the the truth about how they do it is right out in the open. Mm. But the problem is, is people actually have a tendency to want to stay unconscious mm. because when you stay unconscious, you have the illusion that you don't have to take re responsibility for the problems that you're creating. Yeah. So people love just watching television and eating junk food and being mindless. Yeah. But the reality of it is consciousness comes with responsibility. That's why I giggle when I see all these young people saying, I want to be enlightened. I want to be enlightened. How do I get enlightened? And it's not just young people. It's all sorts of people. Mm. It's like, you know, if you really knew what you were saying, you wouldn't be rushing off to the jungle to have your head blown off with a, a three shots of ayahuasca because mm. when you do become conscious, you are also conscious of what you're creating and how it's affecting everyone and, and life itself. The point I'm making, and Steiner drove this home like nobody's business, consciousness is the source, is the primary source of disease. Mm. Because when you're conscious that you're putting garbage in your body, but you do it anyhow, you yeah. have to carry the, the, the karma for that. Yeah. You can't just pawn it off on some doctor and say, what pill do I take? What mm. do I do? Right? Mm. When you realize the banking system's screwed, but we don't get together and say, let's figure out how to reform it. Mm. And you just let the government run away with it. Well, you got the same problems that keep pushing the national debt and you know military budgets and everything through the roof. And then what does Trump do? Trump says, okay, let's give you $2 trillion to help you while you're in this coronavirus epidemic. Mm. And I'm looking at this going, do you have any idea what would happen if we spent $2 trillion <laughs> to teach people how to eat, move, and be healthy? Yeah. How to eat real food, yeah. right? See Everett yeah. Koop previous Surgeon General, got on TV, told everybody 90% of the chronic diseases that kill most Americans are diet and lifestyle related, yeah. and they fired him the next day yeah. for saying that, yeah. right? If we put $2 trillion into public education on how to live in harmony with this planet, and we give stipends to organic and, and biodynamic yeah. farmers, and yeah. gave stipends to support companies to become sustainable, and we stopped using oil, and we use zero-point energy for which there's been numerous patents that have been confiscated. Mm -hmm. We have the technology right now to be completely free of energy, but the people making tons of money off the energy are fighting that like crazy. Mm -hmm. And the list is long. So one of the paradigms that we're in is that we have to stand up as a democracy. Mm -hmm. You know, the government cannot, over, cannot overthrow millions and millions and millions of people who say we won't put up with this anymore. Yeah. But the people that are eating junk food and watching garbage on television and bitching each other out on Facebook don't have time yeah. or the energy to be part of a democracy because they're too caught in the illusion. Yeah. And that's where I see, you know, that's really what the check ins is all about. And um, you know, when we when we start finding out the science behind 5G and all the things that's doing. Okay, so you're trading faster download speeds mm. for a uh, technology that could give countless millions of people cancer and other diseases, has been shown to be extremely destructive in nature. So here we are again. What does it do? It's candy mm. that allows you to stay unconscious and be buried in media, 99% mm. of which is just garbage that's not based on any truth whatsoever. And so... I think we're at a, a really um, dangerous time. And I think one of the key factors we have to do is we really have to rehaul, overhaul our education system. Yeah. Because what is education? It's the basis of the way we see, perceive, believe, and act in the world. Yeah. We've got to get rid of all this corporate funded education. We, you know, I travel all over the world lecturing at conferences and now. And I, instead of getting paid to teach, I have to pay to teach. Mm. And almost every single lecture is tied to something being sold in the trade show. Yeah. So it's not even an educational forum anymore. It's a marketing yeah. forum. Yeah. The education's not even in it anymore. Oh yeah. And yeah. it's it's that way in almost all fields. We've got to oh, go. God. We've got to revamp 
our education system or the kids yeah. of tomorrow are going to be addicted to the same junk food, iPhones, and they're going to be following uh, Mark Zuckerberg's Ten Commandments, and they're all going to be vaccinated with chips in them and poisoned, and they can flip a switch and take them out anytime they want to, because you're dealing with uh, you know a, a separationist concept. Yeah, you're dealing with he who has the gold rules. Yeah, and that, you know, and that idea of separation. In some ways, I think we need to have um, a new paradigm of what it means to be a democracy, because our democracy comes from this sort of 18th century Enlightenment, quote unquote, Enlightenment yeah. tradition, right? From yeah. from Europe, and but built into that sense of democracy, that the whole goal is to create, you know, what they call the liberated individual. Right? Yes. So democracy is built to produce individuals, right? Yes. And right in there is the sense of separation. Yeah. And so somehow we've got to reconceive what it means to be a democracy and to live in a democracy and to participate with one another mm -hmm. in a democracy apart from, you know, uh, whatever it is that uh, the government has in place now. I think individuality is beautiful. That was Jung's driving mm. force behind the creation of depth psychology and in, in, in the whole process of individu individuation means to mm. become whole and to become sure. an adult and take responsibility for your actions and yeah. participate in the world. But, you know, if you think, okay, what, what does God really represent? Well, the, the, you know, the, you could say unity, mm. right? But unity can't know itself as unity. Yeah. Right, it's only because you have a subject-object relationship with James that you can look in the mirror and say, "There's me." Yeah. Right. Yeah. The point I'm making is unity depends on diversity mm. for the experience of love and connection. Mm. And a democracy isn't somewhere where we stop somebody from saying what their opinion is and right. take their videos down, and we control people and we make them follow a set of rules that again narrows diversity down to just a few people's ideas. Yep. And it isn't isolation mm. from each other a democracy is where we act like gnostics mm. what were the gnostics they were a group yeah. of deeply committed spiritualists that got yeah. together on a regular basis and jesus is is is, mm. uh, is on record as being a gnostic yeah and what they did was they talked about the techniques that they discovered or the mm. things that they discovered in their meditative and spiritual practices and mm. they shared them with the group mm. and they practiced and the ones that worked for a bunch of them, they said, well, let's just keep trying that, which mm. led to new discoveries, which yeah. led to new discoveries. So mm. we we need to be healthy hermits, go yeah. home, do our personal growth work, monitor our mind, meditate, get clear on what our dreams for ourselves are and how that contributes to the rest of the world. And then we need to be Gnostic and come together and use the technology that we have yeah. to share great ideas, to share concerns, to share research that says we need to be careful about things, to share research that says this works really well. Hmm. But you can't do that with people filtering everything. Yeah. And you can't do that if you only are interested in opinions that validate your own belief system. I was just going to say you can't be afraid of difference. No. You know, and that's the diversity, right? Yeah. Look, sharks will eat you. Yes. They're very interested in their own opinion <laughs> and their own way, but they're part of a cycle of nature. Yeah. And so all I'm saying is, is that when we realize that you can't really think honestly until you look at opposing viewpoints, mm. this is why David Bohm said, real thinking is challenging. Mm. Most people just rearrange their prejudices and call it thinking. Yeah. Right? Uh, you know me very well. We've mm. been together for a lot of years, right? Yeah. I don't know how long. What, 15 years? Yeah, almost 16. 16 now. years, yeah. right? Yeah. I'm sure you've had experiences of walking into my office and seeing seeing me listening to or studying dogmatic Christian views or yeah. dogmatic Muslim views. Mm. And my wife has said to me, why the hell do you keep <laughs> listening to that stuff? And yeah. I say, I have to understand the disease before I can help create medicine for it. Yeah. Yes, it's irritating, but mm -hmm. it's real, yeah. right? So all I'm saying is, in order to think effectively, I tell my students all the time, any idea worth living is worth challenging. Yeah. If you don't ask yourself, is Jesus really the only begotten son of God? Mm. Is Do you really have to take Jesus as your savior to get to heaven? Most people don't want to ask that question because it'll challenge their belief system. Mm. And by definition, a belief system is closed. 
yeah. which is what starts wars. Yeah. Now we've got to grow up. Now we've got to get mature in our thinking. Now we've got to be our own debater. One yeah. of my exercises, I put up a, a proposition. Hmm. The proposition might be everyone needs to eat organic food. Mm -hmm. Then I go sit on the other side of the table mm -hmm. and I say, okay, now I'm going to debate against myself. Mm -hmm. And I work that debate until I come to a point where I think, okay, I've got the best um, median, the best um, catalyst. Mm -hmm. You know, how do we bring these two things together? Yeah. Right. Well, people would say, well, not everybody can afford organic food. Right. Okay, good. Well, if we stop spending all the money that we're spending on the military budget and we've made it profitable to get into organic food and for organic farming and it became an, a much bigger industry, then the prices would go down. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Like yeah. everything connects to everything else. Yeah. And that that's the paradigm that I think uh, Laszlo's really not saying outright, but yeah. he is saying we need a new paradigm. And the new yeah. paradigm is we we have to start acting like responsible adults, yeah. not passive junk food eating, drug using. Um, and it's not even hippies because hippies were, you know, holistic. <laughs> it's um, it's brainwashed individuals. And I feel yeah. very sad that so many people have been caught. But when you think about it, today most kids are raised in front of televisions getting brainwashed from the minute they come out of the womb. Yeah. So as frustrating as it is, I just have tremendous empathy for people, but those of us that are smart enough and intelligent enough and awake enough to realize what's going on can start educating people. Yeah. And that's really what this whole podcast is about. Let's be, let's wake up. Yeah. If you don't believe me, check my resources. Most people mm -hmm. that argue with me about all sorts of stuff have no foundation for their argument except their own conditioning, Yeah, right? Which is based on superficial uh, you know, not evaluated beliefs. Yeah. I love being demonstrated to be wrong. I say, well, thank you. You just taught me that I can do something better. Yeah. Right. So I think, uh, I'm just really grateful that there's people like Laszlo in the world. Let's, yeah. uh, yeah. want to see what he's got to say now. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's dive into it. All right. Hi, you guys. I sure hope you're enjoying the podcast with Irvin Laszlo and my engaging dialogue with James Phelps. You know, I'm sure you've heard me talk about my search for top quality CBD products in previous podcasts, but the truth is I did look high and low for a year at least to find a certified organic CBD supplier with top quality products. When I tested One Farms products, I was downright impressed. There was no question that their products are the cleanest products with the best energy and effectiveness I've ever tried. One Farm has a beautiful line of CBD oils in different doses and flavors, a water-soluble CBD extract that offers 20 milligrams per serving as a dose, and a lovely soft gel option, a variety of excellent skincare products, a potent turmeric relief cream to ease muscle and joint discomfort, and even a beautiful lip balm. I encourage all of you to go to https colon forward slash forward slash onefarm.com forward slash check. That's https colon forward slash forward slash onefarm.com forward slash c-h-e-k. And when you're there, click the explore tab, then the our story tab to see the beautiful video footage of their farm, soil, water and watering system, CO2 extraction and more. It's really, truly amazing to see how much love and care and attention they put into every step of the process to growing their plants, caring for the soils. They fit my value structure beautifully, and I know for sure when you get their products, you are definitely going to notice how clear, pure, and effective they are. As a sponsor of Living 4D with Paul Check, One Farm generously offers all of you a 15% discount on any purchase by going to HTTPS colon forward slash forward slash onefarm.com forward slash c-h-e-k no discount code is needed just follow the link you'll know you're there because you'll see pictures of me and some of my podcasts featured there and your 15 percent coupon code will be automatically added to your order have a look at their excellent range of cbd oils beauty products edibles and more and i promise you you will be impressed with the quality the cleanliness and the effectiveness of One Farm's awesome certified organic products.
we have a philosophical divide between the main schools of Buddhism and within a number of religions. For example, the Mahayana school encourages us to become enlightened or a Buddha and return for as many lifetimes as it takes to liberate all souls, while the Theravada school, which is similar to Vedanta, essentially suggests that the world is an illusion and the goal is to reach nirvana and exit the illusion. We also have vast differences in fundamentalist teachings of the world's great religions <clears throat> and what the mystics emerging from the same religion say. For example, Rumi says, I want burning, and the fundamentalists of Islam are willing to burn anyone that doesn't agree with their doctrine or draws a picture of Muhammad, and the same could be said of, of the Christian fundamentalists. If we look at the cross-section of people ranging from fundamentalists to mystics, there's clearly a stratification of consciousness, as Arthur M. Young, Gene Gebser, Ken Wilber, and many others have clearly pointed out. When I look, when I look at uh, who sees the big picture, I see people such as yourself, Deepak Chopra, Fred Allen Wolf, Fred Allen Wolf, and others who display characteristics of integral consciousness. But research shows that only makes up two percent of the population. So when I look at who is behind the majority of the corporations and belief systems that are ultimately dividing and destroying the world, they're mostly people at the level of, of the what Ken Wilber refers to as the traditional stage, which he says is about 70% of the population. So my question for you is, can we make the changes needed to both in both bringing the world together for the common good of humanity and and do the healing without fast-tracking those people at lowers, uh, lower levels of consciousness in the structure stages? Or do you think it is honestly going to take a world crisis to knock people out of ethnocentric ideologies and bring us to into a state where we have to work together or we're just not going to survive? Well, a world crisis will certainly knock all this today, the, the conservative, the recalcitrants, uh, will knock them out. But it could knock us all out also. So I think yes. better not to experiment with the world crisis. There is such a thing as a perceived crisis, just re realizing that it's coming, re realizing what, what it could, what it means, what its outcomes could be, and then act accordingly. Even, even if it's not here, act as if it was already here, because it's coming. It is actually coming. It's very close. I used to talk about the bifurcation coming. Now I can say the bifurcation has come. Now it's a question of re of reversing the the way, the past that we have right now, uh, a few years ago, 10, 15 years ago, we have started taking and we have got to move in another direction. So I think yes, you know. all, all these divisions that you mentioned, they are extremely important. They are, they are uh, they at the forefront of thinking. But everywhere there are winds of change moving. Every crisis that we perceive in the world, every conflict, every breakdown, uh, every threat that we perceive is a way of moving us beyond the status quo and moving us away from the, from the past that we have entered on. So I am cautiously <clears throat> optimistic. We don't need large percentage of people. With 2%, this could be enough. There are two elements here to take into account. One is the level of crisis. Uh, because the higher the crisis, the more sensitive the system, the more unstable the system. Therefore, it's the easier to, easier to change. It's a risky to change, but there it is. It's changeable. And the other element is the power, the influence of those who wield the alternative views. How contagious is that view? How far can, how quickly can it spread? Not only bacteria are spreading these days, ideas are spreading too. Not just negative ideas, positive ideas too. In my new book on this reconnecting to the, to the source, I have a whole chapter written with my collaborators looking at the positive signs of change in the world, in politics, in economics, in society, in the, in the sciences, in many, many, in education, many, many areas of the world. There are movements of change. They are still so small, but we don't need an overpowering majority. We need, uh, we need bright, powerful ideas, wielded with commitment, with consciousness, and then in this world, which is already heading to a high level of instability, then in this world, 
these ideas can take can pick pick up can take on can develop and it can become that that what the cyberneticians call the initial kick, kick that kick at the right time which moves the entire system shifts it into another way of developing well as you can see i asked irvin laszlo about the philosophical divide amongst religions the paradox of the mystics finding truths in their own explorations that go completely against organized religions dogma um, I talked about the stratification of consciousness and the fact that only 2% of the world population is at the integral level, which means they're integrated. They have archaic, they have magic, they have mythic, they have mental consciousness. So they've transcended but included, and now they can, at the integral level, Gene Gebsford says you can see through the world, which means you can see into problems and come up with holistic solutions. And so, you know. Irvin had some amazing comments there, James. I'm just curious, you know, what struck you when he gave his answers? Well, the, the big thing that really struck me was that, you know, he, d he does say the crisis is coming, but he doesn't seem to dwell on the problem, right? What he notes, uh, as you said, there's only 2% at a certain level of consciousness, but he says, well, 2% is probably enough. Yes. Right. And so that positivity about, you know, the 2% being enough, and if they, as he said, powerful ideas wielded with consciousness. Yes. Those are that, that's that 2%, and that can be what turns it around. And so I, you know, it's striking to me uh, that, yes, he recognizes the problem, but he doesn't dwell in it. Right? Yeah. And, you know, it, it, and I'm inspired to give a definition of consciousness because, mm. you know, it's a word we use all the time, like God, but it means a million things to most people. But yeah. most people don't really understand what consciousness is. So it's like Bentov says consciousness is defined as the total information carrying capacity of any system. Mm. But another definition, uh, I believe it was uh, John Cyril's definition, is consciousness means that you're aware that you're aware. Mm. So an addict is aware that they have a problem, mm. but they're not aware of their awareness. Mm. In other words, mm -hmm. it's like, yeah, I have a drinking problem. Pass me a bottle. Yep. So that's really not consciousness. Mm. That's just sort of, um, you know, I don't know what to call it. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's sort of um, like you're looking in the mirror and saying, I'm getting fat, but you keep eating the same and living the same. And every day you look in the mirror and you say, yeah. I'm getting fat. Yeah. But if you're aware... Mm. That you're aware mm. that you're making yourself fat. Mm -hmm. That means you're conscious. Yeah. And now if you don't do something about it because you are consciousness, because you are conscious of it, you know who really is the big problem. Yeah. Right? It's the food's not eating you. You're choosing it. Yeah. The lifestyle's not making you do it. You're doing it. Mm. So I think one of the beauties of, of the kind of situation we're in right now with the whole coronavirus epidemic is that we can become conscious mm. that we're conscious mm. that it, it's the unhealthy people that are getting hit by this virus, which mm. is what happens with any virus or any uh, communicable disease with rare exceptions. Mm. But if we're aware that we're aware yeah. that we're, there's changes to make and we're aware that we're aware that we need to share good ideas. We need to exemplify those of us that know how to be healthy and don't walk around in fear of a, you know, a virus and are living in harmony with the universe. Know that even if we did get the virus, it's our job to live in such a way that we optimize our immune system's chance to develop antibodies against it. Yeah. And then it's not a threat to us anymore, which is the same with all environmental pathogens. Yeah. But the key point is, if we're aware that we have health and vitality, and we're aware that we're living in ways that are sustainable, and we're aware that we're not trying to segregate the world into racial, ethnic, and religious um, splinters, mm. um, then those are the things that we have time right now to do. We can use our social, we can use the same weapons of mass distraction mm. to create mass awareness. So paradoxically, we can use all the things in positive ways, right? Mm. Uh, if we have junk food, then we can use it by a, as a reminder of what we don't want to mm. do to ourselves and not put money in the hands of people manufacturing it. 
So yeah. leave some junk food on the table and say, that's my altar to death. Mm. And I'm going to choose the organic carrot and the free range animal and the wild caught fish. And knowing that I have to pay attention to what goes into the ocean because even the wild caught fish get sick. Mm. So therefore I have to not spend money on products that are made by corporations that are poisoning the environment because there's the echo effect coming back to get us. Yeah. And one of the things that he said too is, is that we're at a bifurcation point. Yeah. And, and he, and he's, you know, it was like, we, we are already at the crisis yeah. point, right? Yeah. And so when he said that, it reminded me of something Yoga, Yogi Berra once said, when you get to a fork in the road, take it. <laughs> right. Yeah. And so here we are at a bifurcation. Yeah. We're at a fork in the road. Mm. It's not a question of do we go left or do go do we go right? We take it. Mm. And what I mean by that is we take the problems and instead mm. of saying it's somebody else's fault, it's Donald Trump, it's the oil people, yes, we, we're aware of that. But we keep buying the stuff. Yeah. We keep funding these corporations. We keep feeding these dangerous dragons. Mm. So taking the fork means be honest about how you're participating. Mm. in the things that are destructive and then be aware of what your option is to take the other side of the fork and say, I'm going to replace that with that. Mm. Instead of playing video games, I'm going to spend time researching who people like Bruce Lipton, Deepak Chopra, Irvin mm. Laszlo, et cetera. And I'm going to study that stuff and share key things I learned with my friends and hopefully they're sharing with their friends. And then we spread a wave of consciousness. So we take yeah. that stratification and we give people the opportunity to upgrade their software yeah, so that they can become more aware of what they mm. need to be aware of. yeah. And that's what I mean by taking the fork. Mm. We can't just blame it on somebody else. That doesn't do anything. Yeah. As Lao Tzu said a very long time ago, the government always reflects the people, mm. right? So mm. the government's mirroring our own yeah. shadows back to us. It's mirroring our desire to be children and be spoon fed and mm. to be passive and to be entertained all the time and to avoid the rigors and the challenges of real creative thinking and developing new systems and taking advantage of the opportunity. As you said, when a system's unstable, it's easy yeah. to change. Yeah. Right. So right now, you know, like when I was a competitive boxer, if a guy starts walking backwards and he loses mm. his balance, you mm -hmm. got a chance to get him. Mm. If you're a martial artist and someone throws a spinning kick at you mm. and loses their balance you got them mm. so right now we we can all see that systems need to change the medical mm. system needs to change the whole belief structure around vaccination mm. needs to get much more research oriented mm. and honest as opposed to just confusing people and selling them poison yeah. and you know there's many unstable systems, but there's almost, what, 7 billion people on the planet. We all mm. have a lot of creative intelligence, and we all have unique ways of seeing things. Yeah. And I think if we all take advantage of the opportunity to use our natural gifts, our, I believe everybody's a genius. It's just mm. most people don't listen to their heart, and they believe what other people say. You're not that smart. Mm. You're this. You're that. But if we all really trust that the universe has instilled genius in each of us mm. and say, what makes me feel good mm. that I can do regularly yeah. to share my love and my wisdom with people? Yeah. And we use freedom of speech and we use digital technologies to spread that love around. And we take the 2% of the people that hardly get any airtime like the Dalai Lama and, mm. and many of these other people. And we study their teachings instead of, playing another f uh, video game or being distracted by a mindless TV show or watching stupid stuff on the news and believing it, yeah. then we can actually use some of these technologies in positive ways. And I think that we can, um, you know, we have to be like the bees, right? Mm. The bee spirit told me, Paul, nobody can make honey alone. Mm. And right now we need to make some honey. Yeah. But none of us is going to solve this alone. Yeah. So, you know, you studied ants in, in, yeah. your, in your research. Mm. And, you know, they have a hive mind, right? Yep. So they, each one of them is kind of a neuron in one brain. That's right. Well, we're the same way. That's what the social brain is. 
Yeah. And if we just start connecting ourselves together with the one positive intention of making the world a better place for everybody and making it ethical and moral, yeah. meaning a moral code is a code that protects life. Yeah. We've all got to work together to protect life. Yep. And I think that's really what Laszlo is really telling us is that um, we, we have enough people that if we work together, the 2% are the wise people that can lead us mm. and activate the genius in the rest of us. Yeah. And I really believe that it's going to be young people that come forward with solutions. I really do. Yeah. I think there's a lot of young math geniuses, computer geniuses. There's, there's young you know, kids coming into the earth plane right now to really help us. And I think we need the wisdom of the elders. We need the um, out-of-the-box thinking of the youth. Yeah. And we need to mix meditation with technology, and we need global participation. Yeah. I mean, I think that um, every generation sort of sees its parents in certain light, but I, I think that you know, the, the, what the young kids will see, uh, and I think, you know, gosh, I sound so old saying that, but I, I think that it, even, you know, people in their 19, you know, later teens, early 20s are already seeing disconnection yeah. as the problem, right? They're already seeing that in us, mm -hmm. you know, an alienation from community, an alienation from the work that we do. Uh, and I think that's very present in their consciousness. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, the, I, I think that will certainly drive them uh, and the choices that they make. Yeah. Because they're seeing the effect that it has on, on us, but it's, they're seeing the effect that it has on them too. I mean, sure they are. Uh, in terms of like unemployment, right? You know, yeah. if you are in your late teens and early 20s, you're getting the worst of that. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's a, the good news is though, is, is when we're challenged to meet our needs mm. we have a choice yeah. drop out mm. and be a bum yeah. or get creative and a lot of my greatest thinking came mm. when i was in the most pain yeah. because it gave me every reason to hold still and go deeper into myself and ask mm. for help from the part of me that is more whole than the broken part <laughs> yeah where's that saying right necessity is the mother mother of an invention yes it is and it's very true <laughs> yes it's very true and yeah. i think we have some necessities upon us. Oh, now. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm excited. You know, we mm. get into a number a number of things here moving forward with mm. Irvin, you know, and mm. I, I wish he had more time, but mm. he was, you know, he was in Italy and it was late at night and he's mm. quite old now. So yeah. I was grateful to have what we have. But let's uh, let's dive in and see where this wise old man archetype leads us. Let's do that. Hi, everybody. I'm super excited to tell you about Symbiotica's newest hot off the line product, which I've had the great fortune of testing, and I absolutely love it. It's D3K2 CoQ10. That's D3K2 CoQ10. And when I first tried it, it reminded me of when I first tried Angie's breast milk. It just made me feel so calm and balanced and centered inside. And one of the things I love about Symbiotica products is they're all mycelized, so they're rapidly absorbable, even by the most inflamed, damaged gut. I brought Sherveen in to tell us about this amazing product. This D3 K2 formula has been our pet project for over two years. We put so much time, effort, and research into it. D3 is at the center point of our immune system. It controls over 3,000 genes epigenetically that control how your immune system responds and when it wants to recover from, you know, turning the fever on right. or turning antibodies into any, into any problems in the body. Yeah. D3 is at the center point. That's why the sun is so important. Our D3 comes from lichen. Lichen is a cross between algae and fungus. It's not coming from sheep skin, right. lanolin. It's not coming from a synthetic, something made in a lab. Yeah. It's extracted from lichen. And we combined K2 in there, which is coming from fermented garbanzo beans. Awesome. Let me tell you how important K2 is. K2, we now know, is in charge of activating your body's ability to take free-floating calcium out of your veins, arteries, and tissues, brain, 
heart, and different parts of the cartilage system in your body and put them directly where they belong, in your bones and teeth. And we know that's one of the main issues we're dealing with today with the older society as they're getting older, osteoporosis yes. and other things. Calcification is at the root of all disease. Yeah. Heart disease, the leading cause of death, yeah. boom, right there, we got the K2. And we also have it in not only the MK7 version, but the MK4. Thank you. I really am excited about this product. I love how I feel when I use it. And for me, you know, I'm sensitive to energy. And when I put something in my body that my body immediately says, yes, give me more, I'm excited to share it with everybody. So go to C-Y-M-B-I-O-T-I-K-A.com. Use the code, all caps, C-H-E-K-15. That's all caps, capital C, capital H, capital E, capital K-15 for your 15% discount on any of these amazing products, including the D3K2 CoQ10. Thanks for sharing. Let us know your feedback. As always, love to share with you and hope you enjoy it as much as I do. Yes, I have your book, Reconnecting to Source, right here on my desk. It's an absolutely beautiful book, and I encourage all the listeners to get the book and read it. Uh, Irvin, do you know if it's available on as an Audible book yet? It will be audiobook, yes. It's coming out as an audiobook, but the publication date is March 24 for the, both the print book and the audiobook. And uh, but the books is will be available. I think as of next week, the physical books will be available through Amazon and other places to to be shipped at the time, which is as I said, March twenty fourth. Yes, I'm really glad I was given an advance copy by your publicist, and I. Uh, one of the reasons I'm so excited to talk to you is because I wanted the chance to inspire people to read the book. I mean, I I've read a lot of your books, but I think this one really is. It's the message people need to understand right now, and it's really addressing the issues I'm bringing up here. So thank you. A quick question I have is, you know, looking at, I've studied the structure stages of consciousness quite extensively, and the research shows that it's almost impossible to sway people at the fundamentalist level. They they ignore science. They basically suffer from being in a belief system, which as you know, is a closed system. What tips do you have for accessing these people at that level? Because they make up such a massive percentage of the population. And research shows that these are largely the people who voted Donald Trump in. And I don't think I need to expand on the challenges that that faces. So how do we access these people that are in these closed belief systems that are really stuck in a materialistic paradigm that seem to be so comfortable just you know, using fossil fuels and destroying the planet? I think they're the same people, by the way, who have also voted for the Brexit, for leaving the European Union by uh, by, by Britain. These are short-term thinking people. Sure, short-term you can ex- you can you can improve, increase your power, your wealth, but at what cost? In the long term, it breaks down. So you have to look. At, people have to look at the consequences of their action. Open their eyes. Yeah, I think this fundamental fundamentalism uh, is is about to break down because it's become so obvious that it's untenable. So, so obvious that it it gives us it, it leaves us toward a dead end. And the people have to come to that realization themselves. All they can do is somehow point the way, and sometimes a, a, a seed of a, a seed of an idea will somehow germinate. And that will make that difference. We'll nuclear it and become a powerful source. That's our hope. That's our, that's the chance that we have. That's what we need to go after. So it seems to me, from my observation and years of working in these fields, that it's not a matter of convincing them because they have defense strategies built into their meme structures. But it seems the best way to go is to inspire them. Well. Allow the the recognition that this is a, a very dangerous way to go to dawn. To that recognition has to dawn in people. It's yes. the, my trust comes because what I'm describing also in this new book, and from the confidence, from the insight that the uh, the proper way, the attraction toward the wholeness, toward love toward oneness and belonging with others, or moving together coherently, that this is in us, the same as it is in every atom. 
in every nucleus of every atom as the protons and electrons bind together. It's there in, in, in the deepest layers of the substance of the universe. So it's in us. I call it the holotropic attractor. And I believe that in the spiritual experiences, it comes to the fore. If just you allow, and you could somehow prompt these people who are so blindly moving in the wrong direction to listen to themselves, it would be more powerful than be listening to anybody else. Because they have all the, as you point out yourself, they have all the defense strategies for coping with others. But when it comes from their own insight, and they say, aha, this could be the way to go, or this could be the right way to change. If that happens, you know, then I think that that's more convincing and more potent than any other way. You know, one of the things I've, because I've worked with many people with health crisis, you know, I'm, I'm a holistic health practitioner and I specialize in medical failure. So I get people from all over the world coming to me that have failed in the medical system, often have terminal cancer and things like that. And when I track back the the beliefs behind the behaviors that led to the diseases, I almost always get to these fundamentalist religious beliefs. And what I found is it's almost impossible to get them to look at an other, an, a different religion, such as Buddhism or something like that, to get a different approach. <clears throat> but what I have found very helpful is to encourage them to study the mystics of their own religion, because the mystics really, in many ways, were what we would call integral thinkers. And then they don't feel so threatened because they're working within the construct of their own belief system. I found that to actually be quite powerful pe for people that are willing to to have a look at someone like Meister Eckhart, for example, or Rumi, or any of the mystics from their own religion, Saint Hildegard of Bingen, etc. Do you feel there's uh, some possibility that maybe the mystics, if we inspired them to study the mystics, it might help open them? I think so. I think so. But people, if they can study other people around them, whom they trust, whom they, perhaps they admire, but certainly they have confidence in, and find that these people too, they, they could be successful, they are doing well, and yet they themselves had life-transforming experiences that uh, somehow point to, uh, to a different future, to a different idea of who they are. And I'm tried in this new book to bring together, I think there are some 19 people of, who are well-known people, like Deepak and among others, uh, and, and, and uh, June, uh, Jane, uh, Jane Goodall and others. And yes. These are, and they come up with their own experiences, which are so powerful because they come from people that you think, ah, these are the they look up to. And they actually had these experiences. And it transformed their lives. So if you just allow them to come on, it's the thing, you know, and I reminded a little bit that we had to get on, on the internet connection that we are using. It says, allow the cookies, allow your, your, your uh, recording to be used. I mean, <laughs> it reminded me, we have to allow, yes, we have to allow our ideas, our, our, our beliefs, our convictions to surface and to form and to flower and to share with other people around us. I think this inner guidance is the strongest way and it's the best hope I have that there will be a critical mass of people who are beginning to listen to themselves. The Buddhists have always wanted to do that, as you well know, and many other religions. The mystics all also do want to do that. Among these people who, are in, who I asked to describe the experiences are some mystics like Jean Houston, for example, but the other people you wouldn't expect them to be mystics, but they turned into mystics, like the right. like the inventor of, of the Intel system, you know, a very thoroughly bright mathematician and businessman who have had this experience, who had an experience like this and it completely changed his life. It, it can, it does happen. And it's the most powerful way of changing ourselves and therefore changing the world around us. So James, as you could see, I was posting a really tricky question to him, like yeah. how do you deal yeah. with people that are programmed yeah. so deeply mm. that they're not willing to look outside their own belief system? They're caught right in you really in uh, in a uh, you know a mind virus, yeah, a um, a closed belief system, mm. and having studied 
the science of memetics, whenever they create closed belief systems, they have offense memes, the reward you get right. for sticking to the belief system, and mm. defense memes, how you attack anybody that mm. goes against the belief system, mm. even if they're in your own party. Mm. I mean, think of the battles that go on between husbands and wives over these issues that can yeah. ruin a family. So, you know, he, he had some really great uh, points. And one of the things that he said, which is just bang on, is people have to look at the consequences of their actions, yeah. you know? And, and, and I, I think we all have to look at the consequences of our actions, right? Yeah. Uh, you know, I too have a car that burns gasoline. I hate it. Mm. I could get a battery car, mm. but I've looked into that too. That's another issue. Right? Yeah. Now you've got batteries everywhere and you got, yeah. and you're still, you know, what's charging the batteries. Most of the batteries are being charged by power plants burning coal. Yeah. You know, yeah. so like I said earlier, we have technology for zero point energies. Mm. So we, if we all get together and say, okay, how do we change things? Whether it be, the use of different types of fuels, different types mm. of farming, different types of commerce, different types of ways of engaging and cleaning up the environment. Those are the things that we all have to look at because essentially, at some level, all of us are fundamentalists. Yeah, All of us are addicted to our own dogma and our own habits and our own patterns. And many of us have never known any difference, right? Mm. As long as I've been alive, people have been burning gasoline and engines, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so- as long as I've been alive, people have been going to the store and shopping for food, mm. looking for the cheapest prices, not realizing that food and gasoline are different things. The human body yeah. doesn't just run off energy. It needs nutrition and yeah. information. Yeah. And so if you're getting cheap food, you're getting energy, but you're not getting the nutrition or the information that your cells need to regenerate and, and grow and heal yeah. and, and stay healthy. So um, I think we can all look at the consequences and it was interesting that he said fundamentalism is breaking down. I think, mm. you know, when I look at different statistics, you find that whenever the world goes into a crisis, fundamentalist religions start to grow. Yeah. Because people get afraid, so they reach to the daddy figure in the sky to tell them what to do. Mm. But, you know, anytime you reach into fundamentalism, you're reaching into mythologies that are very, very outdated, mm. usually very poorly interpreted. This is why I often quote Shankara, who says, mm no man can understand scripture until he's enlightened. And when he's enlightened, mm. he doesn't need scripture. Mm. And there's our 2%. They're the yeah. only ones that could really understand fundamentalism. But one of the interesting things about that fundamentalism is breaking down is that, yes, there are indications, for example, um, in, the, in the United States and the West, Christianity is dwindling, mm. but in third world countries, it's growing. Yeah. Now, when we look at fundamentalism as the fundamental ways we use energy, the fundamental mm. ways we educate, the fundamental ways we bank, the fundamental ways we do modern medicine, those mm. things are breaking down. Mm. And so we really do have a chance to pay attention to the crisis that we're creating and get creative and start saying, well, you know what, do we want to keep doing this to ourselves or do we want to do something different? Yeah. And the interesting thing is, is we have a, ancient lineage of holistic healing from medicine men and shaman to witches, yeah. which is in the positive sense of the word, yep. you know, witches were healers. Yep. Um, and, and, and most of the natural medicines that I've made and tried are way more effective than the stuff they sell and give you in hospitals and by doctors. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I uh, share Veen, uh, for the founder of Symbiotica, has an incredible colloidal silver product, for example. Mm. That's probably just as power as powerful as most antibiotics, but it's not going to give you antibiotic resistance or harm you. So my point is there's an ancient technology that's being brought back in a modern era. Yeah. This is the kind of thinking outside of the box, and this is the idea of planting seeds of wisdom. Mm. One of the things I wanted to share, too, is most people don't realize where fundamentalism comes from, but fundamentalism mm. actually has its roots in the religions trying to protect the teachings that they felt were sacred mm. because they worked for the largest number of people. Yeah. And the word religion itself comes from li religio, which means to link back or to reunite or to connect to, which is exactly the same meaning as yoga. Yeah. So when we look at the opportunities and we realize, okay, fundamentalism 
is authentically protecting what we know works. Well, we know organic farming works. Mm. We know biodynamic farming works. We know we have the technology to use quantum, the, the, the zero-point field to create energy sources. Um, yeah. there's, there's a myriad of technologies that corporations have stolen and even murdered the inventors of them. I've mm. got many books documenting that. So really what we've got to do is we've got to go back to that 2% of the population. We've got to go mm. to the genius scientists, the genius inventors, the genius children. Mm. And we've got to let them plant seeds that yeah. we harvest. And we have to say, well, what is fundamental? You know, mm. What is moral? One mm. of the challenges that we face is science has void itself of morality. Mm. They don't care whether you use their atomic bomb to destroy people. They're just so enamored like little boys that they could create one. Mm. You know, they don't care that the microwave oven is very, very uh, damaging to you and your food, but they get money made from it, you yeah. see. Yeah. They don't care if cell phones give you brain cancer. They got a paycheck coming in and their job was just to make it work. Yeah. There's a complete detachment from morality. And yeah. that's a complete detachment from true fundamentalism. Yeah, Because if an invention makes money, but it ultimately results in destruction in society, and means you're probably going to spend a lot of your money trying to heal your diseases, mm. it's immoral. Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, one of the things that fundamentalism, because fundamentalism generally, in, in the ways that we talk about religion and so forth, uh, it tends not to be too resilient, because what it says is that this is the only way to live and be happy. Yes. Or, you know, right? And the problem with that is it requires a kind of isolation to keep that system functioning. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you're exposed to somebody who's living a different way, but is happy and healthy and treats their kids right, yeah. right, and all of that, the, the glue that's holding that fundamentalism together begins to disintegrate. But that's the seeds Laszlo's talking about. Exactly. And, and the, the, you know, what you think of, whether you think the internet is sort of good or bad, it has some good f features in that it makes the world small. It means that I can see lots of other people and lots of other ways of living and be exposed to lots of ideas. And fundamentalism has a really difficult time existing in that smaller world. And I think that, that the, the nature of that, though, is, is because the research shows that the people that are attracted to fundamentalist religions are still archetypally in the yeah. child archetype yeah. phase. Yeah. This is why Osho said all the Abrahamic religions are religions for children because yeah. they all have a big daddy in the sky that <laughs> tells you what to do and punishes you. Yeah. The Eastern religions are religions for adults because there's no big daddy in the sky and you yeah. have to deal with whatever you create for better or worse. Yeah. So, but the thing is, is that just like we have open source systems on the internet, yeah. you know, o open source for software and things like yeah. that, I think what we really need is not an either or, yeah. but an either or and, <laughs> and an mm. X factor. Yeah. A, B, A plus B, mm. and A, B, C, and whatever else we can come up with. So what yeah. I'm saying is I really believe that we need an open source fundamentalism yeah. with the concept of fundamentalism being what is fundamental that we all need. We yeah. all need the planet to be healthy. We yeah. need the oceans to be yeah. healthy. We need the airs to be, mm. you know, alleviated of toxic burden. Mm. We need to get toxins and poisons out of vaccinations. We need to clean up the food supply. We need to clean up the water supply. You know, in other words, the fundamentals yeah. of life yeah. are the things that we all need. Yeah. And if your ideas go against that, mm. then you're working against the fundamentalism that got us here. Yeah. We evolve through nature on fundamentals, right? Yeah. I didn't think that part of what those one of those fundamentals needs to be is, you know, an openness to diversity and an, a sort of intellectual humility, right? That yeah. that uh, you know, my view isn't the only view and be willing to uh, open as you say open source, but open to consider and to understand to difference. Yeah, and I think personally you know, when it comes to the issues of the world, I think that if we really got back to the basics or the fundamentals of what people like Rudolf Steiner taught mm. and many Hippocrates and, and many of the great pioneers of medicine and health, mm. <laughs> Jack LaLanne, for God's sakes, yeah. um, you know, if we got back to those fundamentals, but we said we need an open source yeah. on how to apply them 
yeah. and how to use modern technology to make those yeah. um, technologies more available so that we do can apply these healthy fundamentals across the board. Mm. I don't think we need to reinvent fresh air or clean water or healthy soil Yeah, because we know that works. We yeah. just got to stop going against the fundamental yeah. teachings that mother nature gives us. Yeah. But what we can do is we can, we can use the challenges that we've been through, the challenges that we face, and the wisdom we've gained from the experiences of separation, such as wars, right? Mm -hmm. We can say, well, we, don't, we can't afford another war. Yeah. We can't afford another war. No one's going to win, yeah. right? So what do we do? We work together. Yeah. And everybody needs the same basic things at the end of the day, mm. but there's a great opportunity to use things outside of the paradigm that weren't invented a hundred years ago. Yeah. Right. Now we can clean up oil spills with bacteria. Who would have thought of that? Yeah. Right. So there's a non fundamentalist idea, the use of science mm. to use bacteria to clean up an oil spill in the ocean. And now what we're doing is using a non fundamental idea mm. that's novel mm. that brings us back to the capacity to live the fundamental principles uh, of nature, which are based, they're called laws for a reason. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, there's, nature doesn't have cops, mm. but she does have diseases. Yeah. <laughs> and she does have plagues. Yeah. And she does have storms mm. and earthquakes. And, and, you know, she has her own immune system and, and she will write herself. Yeah. You know, and, um, I loved his comment on, you know, the holotropic attractor, you know, mm. hollow wholeness um, is calling itself home. I mean, if you, you know, Fred Allen Wolf, like I said, said sex is the future calling us forward into our potential mm. or into our own embodiment. Well, if God is God and God exists, then God is the ultimate symbol of wholeness. Mm. And if we remember that the best thing to do to find God in any situation is ask the question, what would love do now? Yeah. I think if we just approach this whole thing with the question, what would love do now? Not who do I blame or who do I, you know, get rid of, but how do we handle this problem child before us? Yeah. And trust that the universe will inspire us because it is wholeness itself. Then I think it's really an, a, a really a golden opportunity. I mean, we can go two ways here. We can all just keep doing what we're doing and mm -hmm. medicating ourselves and just cross our fingers and hope that we, we die before the <laughs> world collapses and <laughs> the resources are gone and then wonder what our kids are going to do. But yeah. Or we can say, you know, now's a chance to, we got time to sit at home and meditate and mm. really see how can we contribute to the problem. And sometimes, you know, as Einstein said, you can't solve a problem with the same thinking that created it. Yeah. Well, right now, a lot of people aren't at work. A lot of people mm. have been knocked out of their ordinary routines and rhythms and, and, and the things that distract them from having the time to really get deep yeah. into their own higher self connection yeah. with their soul. And so yeah. now we have the time to do this. And now we have time to listen to those 2%, the Joe yeah. Dispenza's, the Deepak Chopra's, the Jack Cornfield's, the, you know, the, mm. uh, Oh, there's too, too many of them, right? Yeah. Ram Das, even mm. though he just died. Thank you, uh, Ram Das. I love you. Blessings. Mm. Um, I mean, it doesn't matter whether they're dead or alive. We have we we still have books. Yeah. We still have audios. We have videos. Alan Watts. I mean, listen right. to Alan Watts. If that doesn't change your day, you're already dead. <laughs> yeah. um, so we can go to the to the great minds of our day, and and even the yeah. great minds of science. Yeah, and we can come up with solutions i mean the world's full of 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 you know really earth shattering breathtaking concepts that were total paradigm shifts yeah and sometimes they come from the most unexpected places mm. right and i think um any one of the people listening may be mm -hmm. one of the one of the great leaders coming forward and so oh, sure. i say let's connect ourselves to wholeness and let it call us home but in order to get the call we got to uh, get rid of our fear and yeah. poor me and stop watching garbage on television and be willing to be present with the silence that speaks or we're just going to well we're going to implode even further yeah and i think that uh, you know 
letting go of our fear is the big thing, right? Letting yeah. go of the fear of others, of other people, of yeah. other ideas. And yes. if you can do that, then the allowing that he's talking about in this, allowing people to come to the, the realization, allowing it to dawn on them will happen. Yeah, fear never makes a good seeing eye dog. <laughs> no. So, I mean, we're walking a little bit blind right now. Yeah. And so if you're so afraid that you can't pay attention to what's going on, then you and your dog both get killed. Yeah. But fear can be a great motivator, hmm. right? There's been many times in my life I was afraid that I was going to not have enough money or, you know, afraid that maybe my injury wouldn't heal. Hmm. But it just brought me into a deeper listening state. Yeah. And, and I think when you get pushed to the edge of yourself, that's where the greatest growth really happens. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it's just too easy to stay stuck in habit patterns. Yeah. Let's see what else the wise man has to say. All right. My next question is one I am very grateful that I get to ask you because I think your experience as a scientist and as a man with a lot of world knowledge can shed some deep light on this. And my question is this, there seems to be a serious lack of moral principles in science at large, particularly with the use of dangerous technologies such as military technologies, energy production, and the continued use of fossil fuels, communication technologies, and the dangers of such systems as 5G medicine and the abuse of antibiotics and drugs and other technologies coming from science that are potentially terminally destructive to humans and the world. What do you feel we need to do to put morality and higher consciousness back into science and big industry? And what are the consequences if we don't accomplish this? Because I really feel what science was intended to be has broken down very seriously. I look at research all the time in all aspects of the health. I have a friend who's an FDA agent and he's busted several medical doctors for writing peer-reviewed papers that actually get published in major medical journals that were never actually studies that were done at all. They were just made up. And there's this kind of corporate prostitution among scientists now is rampant. So how do we get morality back into science and, and how important is that before we uh, suffer the consequences of letting science uh, keep running itself for money and, and manipulating statistics and outcomes to get corporations richer but not really produce honest science? Well, unfortunately, there is this constant com uh, misidentification of science. Uh, what is actually technology and technicians are considered scientists and science, and it's a big difference. Uh, the technicians, the technologists, are basically business people, and they are for sale. They have to use their knowledge for what for they and the goal is the highest bidder. I think science, as is practiced by the great physicists, the great biologists, the great psychologists, is an entirely different thing. And they ought to really reserve the term science for those people. And Einstein, and Schrödinger, a Pauli, a Planck, a Jung, etc. Right. These, these going with their insights is is the way forward. But they are not here to be sold to to sell their knowledge to the on the marketplace. So those are the ones that we have to identify with science and make sure that what we consider very often we very loosely use the scientists have developed the scientists have have set up that system, et cetera. They are technicians. They use science as a basis, but they borrow from science the concepts and the theories. They themselves are not scientists. They are, they are business people and they are power seekers like in any other field of, of enterprise. Yes, unfortunately, the, the public is very confused because their findings are published in journals and shared in the media and purported to be real science. And our culture is conditioned to believe science is like a god. So I thank, I thank you very much for making that distinction. I think that's something we all need to remember. There's a difference between technicians uh, using science to sell things and real science. And I think if we can differentiate that, we will uh, be a lot less likely to be duped by bogus uh, or pseudoscience. Exactly, exactly. I agree. Well, James, you know, as you can see, that was a really important question I was asking mm -hmm. about the lack of moral principles in science. I actually thought his answer was just an incredible one. It certainly yeah. wasn't what I expected, but it, it really was like, wow, ringing the bell. Yes, most mm -hmm. of these guys are technicians, 
they're not really scientists. Yeah. And so one of the challenges I see is that the public doesn't have a mechanism for determining who's the technician and who's the scientist. Yeah. And unfortunately, as much as I agree with Irvin Laszlo, this, the, the scientists out there should be standing up for the public and mm. alarming them to say, look, this is not our science. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, one thing, having studied three different biographies of Einstein, one of the things that just turned him inside out was when his research was used to make a nuclear bomb to destroy people, right? Yeah. And other yeah. scientists that were involved in that. Um, um, yeah. You know, there's, a, there's, there's many such cases of scientists who are hired or, or forced, you know, for example, or... Um, Victor Schauberger, who's famous for his research on water, was captured by Hitler and put in a, in put in a concentration camp. And at gunpoint, Schauberger was commanded by Hitler to develop a flying saucer. Mm -hmm. And so he said, here's a list of all the scientists that I have here in the concentration camp. Choose any of them you want, put a team together, but mm -hmm. <laughs> you build a flying saucer or else. Mm -hmm. Well, they did build one. Mm -hmm. And the fortunate thing is, is they couldn't control it. Uh, yeah. It flew right through the roof of the building that they tested it in, and then it just went, you know, it was going yeah. all over the place, and they never were able to control it. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, imagine if Hitler would have had flying saucers, how much mm -hmm. trouble we'd have been in. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's an example of a real scientist being forced. And, yeah. you know, a lot of people that are scientists that are moral – um, are afraid to lose their jobs and afraid that maybe their families will get attacked. But this is where we all have to ha have some warrior spirit in us, right? Yeah. This is why I always tell a lot of people, read the Bhagavad Gita if you want to really get a good understanding of how challenging things can be and how sometimes you even have to go to war against your own family members mm. because the drama of life gives you choices and sometimes either way you go. It's like a question of which hand would you like me to cut off, your left hand or your right hand? I mean, you know, there's no easy answer for that. Yeah. And we're at a tipping point right now where we, we have to make some tough decisions, but we can't, you know, look at what's happening right now. Donald Trump just last night came on television and, and released in the media that He's not going to support the World Health Organization, and he's rejecting uh, Bill Gates's scare tactics and the whole deal. But what happened was, is he got bogus science, yeah. and that's one of the things that's come out of this whole coronavirus thing, is that governments were reacting to information by scientists, mm. which other scientists have come out of the closet and said they were actually capitalizing on partial information in order to create a scare because it's the perfect environment to get funding to make vaccines and do lots of other research. And they knew that they didn't have complete answers. They knew they didn't even have a test for the virus, but they ran with the ball. And the problem is those are the scientists the governments hire for real information, mm. but there is a, a personal agenda going on mm. or a, shall we call an ethnocentric agenda, my group. Mm. And so we're, we're really, really in a dangerous situation because we can't tell technicians from scientists, real science from bogus science, unless you're one of the handful of people that have the knowledge to make those distinctions, and what, which means you're probably one of the 2%. Mm. So it is a very slippery slope we're on, but what I tell people all the time is, you know, <laughs> don't just believe things that you read. Yeah. Ask yourself, is it working in my life? If I do it and do it, yeah. if, if it's, unless you know for sure not to do it, right? Mm. Um, you know, like a lot of the things I just know for sure not to do. But when I'm learning a new technique or anything from some great mind, I, 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 I honor the wisdom and the intelligence, but I also have to say, is it applicable in the environment that I'm going to be using it in? Is it applicable yeah. for this client or patient? And which one would it not be applicable for? Kind of like mm. psychedelics. Yeah. Psychedelics are really like a panacea for a lot of health problems, but there's definitely mm. people that you should not give psychedelics to, for example, a schizophrenic. Yeah. You know, um, so we have to sort of grow up and learn to discern yeah. good science from bot science, purchase science. Yeah. We have to discern technicians from scientists. Yeah. 
we have to discern whether an idea has a limited range of application or a broad range of application. Mm. And this is going to take a lot of support from honest scientists because yeah. how do other people that aren't scientists make those distinctions? Yeah. Right? Yeah. And this goes right back to our education systems. Yeah. Our education systems teach us to worship anybody with a master's degree or a PhD or an MD or a doctor of science degree and not mm. question them, which goes right back to religious programming because the white coats are the priests. Yeah. So we've got this sort of antiquated childlike worship of, of uh, intellectual deities, but we don't have the depth of adult maturity to see when we're getting the wool pulled over our eyes. And the fascinating part is that I, I think that even though we have this worship of intellectual entities, we don't have any kind of worship of understanding. And yes. and the you know so you want to watch something interesting, um, especially this happens a lot during presidential elections. You hear people talk a lot about funding for science, mm -hmm. and the only science that the government ever wants to fund is science that will immediately make money. Yes, right. In in Laszlo's terminology, the technologists. Yes, uh, and they will laugh about other sort of science that doesn't seem to provide them with some kind of immediate product. Right. Right. And so you've got the government, in a way, reinforcing this conflation mm -hmm. between technology and science and not really wanting to pay for understanding. Right. Which is the, you know, the, which is the real virtue, which is what we should be striving for. And, you know, you bring up an important point, which I'm going to elaborate, probably throw you a bit of a curveball. Let's look at, <clears throat> let's look at the word understanding. Mm. If a Swiss ball is under you and you're standing on it, it's very unstable. Yeah. So you better have a pretty solid understanding of how to balance yourself on yeah. that thing. Yeah. So the word understanding really means to have a foundation of legitimate knowledge upon which you can stand without the risk of falling on your face. Yeah. Okay. What does that get back to? Mm. <laughs> doctor diet, doctor quiet, yeah. doctor movement, doctor happiness, nutrition, hydration, sleep, breathing, thinking, and movement. Yeah. Right. <clears throat> so what we're looking for is an understanding of the fundamentals, once again, mm. of what supports life. Yeah. And if we don't support what supports us, then we're just, you know, worse than the village idiot. Yeah. You know, and we deserve ourselves. Yeah. And so who are the people we need to listen to? We need to listen to people that have an understanding and their life is a reflection of that. Yeah. It is a living example of that. Mm -hmm. As I tell people all the time, don't get health advice from sick people. Yeah. Don't go to sick doctors and therapists to learn how to be healthy mm -hmm. because they don't have an understanding. Just because you have a degree, that does not mean you have understanding. Yep. And so I think we all need to reach back for a thing called common sense. Mm -hmm. Right. Look, I don't care if your pimple cream works really well. It's not telling you anything about how you got pimples. <laughs> Therefore, you don't have an understanding about your skin condition. Mm. You're just listening to some technician tell you, hey, look, with a little hyaluronic acid, we can change the pH of your skin, tighten it up, <laughs> and it makes your pimples look like they disappeared, but we just locked all the poison in your body. Yeah. So, you know, the, the, the common sense is, is this a Band-Aid? Or is this a solution? Yeah. Is tr $2 trillion going into the public to compensate for bad science and manipulation by key people and understanding? No. Mm. It's a Band-Aid, and it's a very, very badly appropriated Band-Aid because it's only taking us deeper into national debt, making our taxes go up. Mm. So we get less and less money for what we do do, mm. which makes people more and more tired, which makes them eat more and more junk food and drink more alcohol and get more and more unconscious. Mm. Like if, if we want an understanding, we have to start by understanding what is it that's realistic for an yeah. industrialized nation to do yeah. on a weekly basis before the point at which the whole consumerist capitalist environment yeah. puts you in a position with predatory lending and credit cards where you actually have <laughs> to work so hard that yeah. there's no life left in you and you have to yeah. medicate yourself and numb yourself just to do the treadmill, yeah. you know, be the lab rat on the treadmill. Yeah. So it, to me, a lot of these things boil back down to simple solutions, and the simple solutions are back to the fundamentals of what supports life and orienting ourselves towards yeah. 
reestablishing those fundamentals, and anything that departs from that is not going to be solid science at this point, mm. right? Um, we we got to get away from all the gadgets and the quick fixes. And the reality of it is that to make these kinds of transitions, we have to go through some discomfort. And I think one of the beauties of the coronavirus is it's giving us a chance to experience the stress of transition, Yeah. right? Yeah. Any significant change comes with some discomfort because there's, it's always yeah. the ego has a really hard time letting go of its habitual patterns. Mm. So, you know, if we stopped buying fossil fuels, yeah. yes, a lot of people would have a hard time getting to and from work, but out comes the bicycles and maybe we can carpool yeah. and reduce. There's a lot of ways we could just starve that dragon out, but it yeah. would require some of us have to go through a little discomfort. Yeah. And I don't think there's any way through the situation we're in without us going into a legitimate shamanic journey together and saying, mm. okay, it might get comfortable. We might get hungry. We might get thirsty. We might get cold. We might get wet. Yeah. Um, but if we're doing that, knowing that we're moving towards a solution that ultimately brings harmony and balance back, yeah, I'm all game for it. Mm. I'm I'm totally for it. Yeah, you know, I th I think when you're in a situation like that, and as you said, it inspires creativity. Mm. So there's a lot of really beautiful opportunities, even mm. though. You know, Bill Gates may have the patent on the coronavirus. In other words, it doesn't matter if it's it's evil at work. Mm. You know, evil in the mirror is good. Good in the mirror is evil. The mm. mirror reverses things, right? Mm. Um, we we can. Part of alchemy is learning to convert one substance into another, right? And we need to use the principles of alchemy. The first of which is as above, so below, which simply yeah. means whatever you're creating in your head is going to manifest in your life. Yeah. And if you don't manage your body, it distorts your head. Mm. So we we have to say, okay, let's let's do some alchemy. We need we need chemical alchemy, mm. which is chemistry. We need mm. to change the chemistry of the planet. We need social alchemy. We mm. need to use the principles of alchemy to harmonize us as mm. societies and a culture and yeah. cultures. And we need spiritual alchemy. We have to mm. say, you know, what's the ultimate reason we're doing all this? Mm. Well, in my opinion is so we can really understand who and what we are mm. and celebrate life together and create a place that's safer for our children to have that experience as well. Yeah. But right now we don't have an understanding for our children. Yeah. Right. And we don't have enough people that are that are sh warrior fit to mm. go a little bit hungry and make some sacrifices because we have a bunch of people that are really sort of like kids that are uh, addicted to being spoon fed and told what to do and trusting that the government will take care of everything for them. And at the end of the day, you know, I was going to mention earlier, um, you know, I, I've studied uh, Adam Smith's biography and. One of the things that Adam Smith, the great economist, brought up in his writings, he, he said everywhere he went, he saw businessmen having meetings about how to coerce people mm. into buying things and how to manipulate people into getting more money out of them. Mm. And he warned, when was it, the 1700s, Adam Smith? Yeah. yeah. 17 something. He warned that you must not let businesses and corporations into government yeah. or it would be disastrous. And what do mm. we have today? We have governments and lobbyists full of corporate entities. Yeah. They are inside our government. They're inside our lobbies. Mm -hmm. We have re religious influences that are often negative. The governments, the presidents always go to p religious leaders to manipulate them and get their, uh, yep. to swing the vote. You know, we're breaking all the very rules that the founding fathers of the United States put down so we could actually not have to go through civil wars and do all the crazy stuff that they had to go through. Yeah. And so at the end of the day, we need a revolution, mm. right? A civil war is people on two sides of, of a fence, both in the same country, usually of the same color metaphorically, with violently opposed opinions about how mm. we should live. Yeah. Well, the paradox is, is the war is really us against us. It is. 
It's our own bad habits, and it's our own passivity, and it's our own unwillingness to think out of the box and keep buying things that don't work and just accept the status quo yeah. and ignore the fact that, you know, right now one in two people are going to get cancer in their lifetime, and in the statistics, any day now we're going to be 100%. Yeah. I mean, how far do we want to go before we say, wait a minute, <laughs> yeah. we, have, we don't have a very good understanding of what causes cancer, yeah. or we would be standing on top of a firm foundation of uh, you know a better track record i yeah. mean the united states has the most expensive healthcare system in the world but it ranks 37th in the world well it's, that doesn't show a good no, understanding it's right terrible. so why do we keep funding this yeah why why did we accept obama's mandatory or was it obama or clinton that did the mandatory in medical insurance Mm. which is, yep. is one of the biggest scams ever. It's very yeah. expensive. And, and mm. having now had two children and going through this, talk about a ripoff. They were billing us $35 for one of those tiny little airport airplane boxes of cornflakes. Yeah. I mean, when you look at how badly the system's being manipulated from yeah. the inside by corporations, it's yeah. really bad. But at the mm. end of the day, what am I saying? We, we really have to get back to basics and we're at a point now where if we aren't willing to sacrifice something to work together to create something that's more sustainable, yeah. then we might as well just hug and kiss each other and, and accept that our days are very numbered. Yeah. Yeah, it's it's um it's crazy. There's this really fascinating book called um The Big Sort. And the Big Sort, the you know, so there's all this uh polarization in the United States, right? P primarily political, but there's other kinds. What, what this author shows is that somewhere around the 1970s, it became really easy for people to move across country. Yes. And what they did was just say people would find places where other most of the other people there had like were of quote unquote like minds. Mm -hmm. And so you people would just were sorting themselves into homo homogeneity. Right. right. Yeah. And nothing good comes out of homogeneity, right? Because you don't you don't ever get your beliefs challenged. Mm -hmm. You don't have to live with difference. Yeah. You, you know, and so the more people lived with people who thought the same way, the more it reinforced their beliefs and the more rigid and the more well fundamental they became yeah. mm -hmm. in their beliefs. Uh, and so this goes back to everything that we've been saying is you we have to learn how to be together as a community of people who have differences. Yeah. And 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 celebrate the differences yeah right that's yeah. one of the things i love about houston smith mm. he's the only guy in the world that i know of and i've studied this a lot yeah that devoted five years of his life to studying yeah. and living with the people in the countries that practice the world's five major religions yeah five years of christian five years of muslim five years practicing judaism etc Taoism. Mm. you know that's someone who embraced each philosophy mm. and then developed the wisdom to become the world's leading professor of religion and comparative religion yeah. because he had eat, sleep, breathe, and live them mm. and could show you where the beautiful parts of each of them were. And yeah. then in his writing shows you how you can use the fundamentals of these yeah. different philosophies and marry them together yeah. into a greater whole. Yeah. Right. If we only focus on what's wrong mm -hmm. and we don't focus on what's right with people that mm -hmm. oppose us, then we never actually get an understanding. Because, yeah. like you said, we're we, we're like a racing horse with blinders on and can only mm -hmm. see straight forward. Yeah. And right now, as the Hopi prophecy said very clearly, if we keep doing what we're doing, they drew. You know, have you seen the the mm -hmm. the art that they yeah. did on this rock yeah the, the technological path one comes to a dead end mm -hmm. but the people that go back to living close to the earth and the trail goes on all the way around the rock mm. so we can keep going but if we keep falling in love with technicians and bogus science and yeah. letting people do our thinking and take the easy path and just stare at television screens and eat junk food Mm. Well, I don't think you need to be a mathematical genius to figure out that, uh, you know, <laughs> the X factor equals zero. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. it's um, coming. 
Anything else you want to add? No, I'm ready. Uh, I guess we're at the last question for for uh, Irvin. So I think I'm, so. And, and yeah. you know, he did give me a few extra minutes uh, out of the goodness of his heart. So there might be a little more. But let's yeah. see what he has to say here as we get toward the end of the interview. Fantastic. I have one last question for you. I know you don't have a lot of time. Do you have time for my last question? Well, one last question. Yes, thank you. In my observation, what one believes will happen to them when they die is correlated with how they live and relate to others and the planet. Do you feel there's a correlation here? And what do you feel happens when you die? Well, I can point to the fact that in cultures where there is a deep belief, traditional belief in reincarnation, there is less violence and there is less uh, this kind of immorality that you mentioned, uh, less selling oneself out, uh, because one feels that, perhaps this is why, because one feels that one is coming back. Right. But it's certainly if we have a deeper sense of spirituality, a deeper spirituality, you are not just a competitor in the marketplace for the uh, selling yourself to the highest bidder. Uh, no, then you have a feeling that you have something to do to do here, some sense of mission, some sense of commitment, some sense of purpose. So I think uh, if you have a deeper spirituality, whether it's the Christian spirituality, the Buddhist spirituality, whether it's Tao or Javi or even Mohammed or whatever, we, or the great spirit, and certainly indigenous people have that. Yes. Uh, sense of identification with, with the world around them. Is that that would be a big good way to go. But its religion is a very, very powerful instrument and it's being wielded very often to keep people in check around themselves and supporting them. And it's very difficult to change the structures of religion, just as difficult to change as, as the structures of the technologists. These are all working for the short term for their own short-term interests and being pretty well blind to the long-term and to the interests of the world around them. Our hope is that the crisis comes before it really, the roof falls in, the crisis become perceived by people so that they will begin to recognize that this is not the good story, this is not the right way. And then they start changing from the inside out rather from the top down because there is no good top that would change us but the good things are in us, the, or the, our deeper consciousness, or our mystical uh, streak, our spirituality. I think it's in us, and uh, I'm trying to discuss this, or even in scientific terms, that it's bound to be in us, because the universe could not be a chance evolutionary system. It's something that evolves on the basis of a deeper sense of direction, a, visa, a deeper, what I call an attractor, an attractor toward wholeness, toward, toward belonging together, towards joining together rather than working against each other. Nature doesn't work against one another. Nature is primarily a cooperative enterprise. Even if in the short term there are, there are conflicts and there are, and there's a food chain, but nature on the whole, as the new biologist clearly points out, is cooperative rather much more than competitive. And so is the cosmos. So is the, 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 the whole galaxy around us. So let's learn from the world, from the cosmos, from nature, because we are ourselves a part of that world which evolves toward oneness. And it's this sense of evolution, this sense of where we are going is in us. And it's expressed in us as a sense of oneness, the sense of belonging. And the young people say unconditional love that is all an expression, a manifestation of this deep attractor, which is there in the cosmos and which is there in each one of us. Yes, I, I, I'd like to hear your opinion on something I share with my students and people that are, you know, going through a crisis of someone dying in the family. And when Kobe Bryant died, he was a client of mine, and I got a load of emails and people reaching out to me to share my feelings about that. But I tell people that life and death are the names of two halves of a circle and that consciousness cannot die. It just transforms. Uh, what's your, how do you feel about that statement? Well, I've been saying that I wrote uh, several books now on the topic earlier 
One of them is the, the immortal mind, it's called. Yes, I have it. The intelligence of the cosmos. It all came out the last few years. And I fully agree, I fully believe, I share this belief that consciousness does not die. Consciousness is an ongoing, evolving entity which is only reflected or is being expressed as being hosted in a body. But in itself, it is something much deeper than the, than the biochemical, biophysical body. Right. I'm, now, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. Thank you. So, James, you know, you can see that I was asking that question for yeah. a big reason. Yeah. Having worked with people that are, you know, in serious disease states, afraid to die, right. working with people who have suffered deaths in the family and all all things, and having been through it myself, and, and having had so many years to study people's belief systems, I've found mm. there's a direct parallel between what people believe will happen when they die and how they live, mm. right? When people think nothing happens when you die, screen to black, they're usually very materialistic. Mm. And they're like, use it, screw it, write it, fuck it, destroy it. Who gives a shit? I'm going to be gone anyhow. That's your problem. I won't be here. Mm. And so that's one of the problems we have right now yeah. is that sort of the, the earth is just a bunch of dirt who gives mm. a damn drill holes and it blow it up yeah you know and here we all are um i loved his answer what do you think is answer yeah i mean uh the point about well look if you believe in reincarnation and you're going to come back and what you come back is next time is largely determined by what you do in this life yeah it certainly gives you um makes you a little bit more thoughtful about the yeah. way you conduct yourself in life yeah yeah you know a lot of people of course, resist the idea of reincarnation, mm. <laughs> and even Christians. But I think, uh, well, what do you think happened when Jesus rose from the dead? Mm. What do you call that? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. And but anyhow, without a whole discussion of reincarnation, I think though, you know, when you look at all the world religions, there's plenty of 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 uh, belief in reincarnation, and and there's plenty of research to support it at this point. People like Ian Stevenson with twenty five hundred documented cases of people that not only could give accurate details about who they were in their last lifetime but they could mm. go look them up and there they were i mean yeah. if 2500 cases with one scientist at the helm isn't enough then what do you need to do have an enema full of truth or what yeah, yeah but i you know and even uh, you know we've been talking about fundamentalism and in some ways how about how the fundamentalist abrahamic traditions are very you know childlike in the sense that right sky fathers up there waiting yeah. to punish right and, and in that that light well life is just one big test and sky fathers waiting to punish you at the yeah. end and mm -hmm. what a miserable way to live your life yeah right and yeah. and who, who wants to be with a father like that mm. You know, and that yeah. unfortunately, in my experience, is directly linked to all the violence in yeah. religious families raising parents, uh, parents raising kids. Hmm. And I've talked about this in other podcasts, but I've never seen more violence in my experience than working with the uh, people of Catholic families. Hmm. Um, and and that's a that you know the God of the Old Testament is a is a real prick. Yeah, and uh, you know so when we look at a lot of these beliefs and behaviors and the, you know, the whole concept of the fall and that we're sinners from the beginning and mm -hmm. God sent us down here to be punished and, you know, toil in the rocks and the thorns forever. Yeah. You know, people with those kind of belief systems often develop a sort of a, a uh, an angst or an anger towards the earth. It's mm -hmm. almost like the earth is my prison cell. I can't wait to get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. And while I'm here, I'm going to pay the bitch back. Yep. You know, and, and a lot of people don't look at these things, but when you study belief systems, these, the handwriting's right there on the wall. Yeah. And so um, I think the concept of reincarnation has a real practical application. And here's my mm. practical application of reincarnation. Mm. Tonight when you're sound asleep, you could die and not even know it. Mm. Isn't that true? Yeah. I could walk in your of bedroom course. and cut your throat and you would not even know it. Yeah, let's oh. not do that though. No, of course not. I would, I would <laughs> no. I'll probably come give you a big kiss. <laughs> You'll know I'm there. You'll smell, <laughs> smell the tobacco. But the yeah. point I'm making yeah. is we die every night yeah. and we reincarnate every morning. Yeah. The question is, are we going to reincarnate the ideas that are not serving us, that aren't mm. producing more love and more connection and more wholeness in our life and supporting nature? Or mm. are we going to keep reincarnating the same bad Mm. you know tainted mythologies and and fear-based belief behaviors and 
And uh, are we going to keep reincarnating bogus science, as Laszlo says, it's not by scientists, it's by technicians. Yeah. Are we going to keep reincarnating uh, businesses that destroy the planet and keep raising the prices on their goods and making us pay for it? Are we going to keep um, voting in presidents that um, are the the uh, CEO of a large corporate entity called the United States government that's really mm-hmm. not a government whatsoever? In fact, one of my little you know, checkisms is uh, take a word, take the word govern and put a dash Mm. and between govern and meant and then put a question mark behind it Mm. govern meant yeah it used to be to lead people for the sovereignty of the nation and the land and the people Mm. but now we don't know what government means it means who's got the highest bidder who's the highest bidder who's got the most technology who's got the most power and the most ability to manipulate people yeah and that's the government yeah unfortunately um and i also love when he said something very profoundly true it change has to come from the inside it's not an outside job but you know we go back to our education systems what do you have professors telling you how you have to do things telling mm. you how you have to live and mm. then you got religion telling you what you must do or god will burn you in hell mm. Mm. so really those are we, we've been so conditioned to outside oriented um direction yeah that most people find it almost like um, their first day in school when they start doing things like meditation and real spiritual practices because our system is devoid of that. Yeah. But if you were to go to Tibet and be raised there, mm. you would have a system that's inner-oriented mm. and not outward-oriented. And you know, debate is a real big part of Buddhism. These guys come up with yeah. ideas and they debate each other to yeah. the nth degree to really get an understanding. Mm. Right to really find out where the ground is, mm. and I love that, and I love the Dalai Lama's teachings because he's a product of that tradition. And I mean, I mean, <laughs> if I was going to put somebody in charge of the planet right now, I would choose the Dalai Lama. Sure, yeah, it'd be a safe, safe thing to do. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it would be a safe thing no matter what religion you're in, because here's a guy who's deeply spiritual, yeah. very developed in his inner arts, has a deep understanding of science and quantum physics has a deep understanding of economy, a deep understanding of the responsibilities of government and leadership, mm. and cares about people. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. There's somebody who needs a lot more airtime. Yeah. You know, the, his part about reincarnation made me think of the German philosopher Nietzsche, right? yeah. who had his principle of the, the eternal return of the same. Now, Nietzsche himself was an atheist, so whatever you think about it, you know, him in that regard is one thing, but the the whole point of it wasn't a, a metaphysical principle, but it was sort of a guiding principle about how you live your life. And to ask yourself, it, to imagine if I were going to have to live this life again, would I be happy with how it's turning out right now? Yeah. <laughs> and if it's not, yeah. then change it. But, you know, so so eternal return of the same was, uh, you know, a, a principle about how to live your life yeah. and how to shape your life in ways that if you had to live it again, well, shape it so that you enjoy it, that you make the world a better place, that you, you know, all these things that we talk about is, you know, being important. Yeah. You know, and, and, and we're... As Laszlo said, the universe is an attractor and it's moving mm-hmm. toward wholeness and nature is a cooperative enterprise and its nature is a product of, of the universe. It's, you yeah. know, it, the na- nature exists within the confines of the universe. Yeah. You know, and so I, in meditation one time, my soul gave me a definition of evolution from a spiritual perspective mm. and all of a sudden, um, the sum, this, the letters started popping up, but my soul was writing it backwards. And mm. so, for those of you listening, get a pen out or a pencil mm. and write the word evolution, E V O L U T I O N. And mm. now go backwards and between the O and the I, working backwards, so N O, put an I, I mean a dash between the O and an I, then a dash between the T and the U and a dash between the U and the L. And my soul said, now read it backwards. And it says, no it you love. Hmm. So what is evolution? There's no thing that you're addicted to or attracted to or you overly identify yourself with. Hmm. True evolution is when there's no it you love and you realize that the whole Hmm. universe is the product of unconditional love and it's the product of a unity 
So mm. you don't only love you, people of your own religion or your own scientific right. bias or your own political bias. And what did Buddha say? Don't fall in love with things. Desire for things keeps you on the wheel of samsara. Mm. Fall in love with life. Live fully. Yeah. But don't get sucked into deifying things, which is mm. you know why the last thing Buddha said before he died is, please don't make statues of me. Mm. But it turns out to be he's the most statued man <laughs> that ever lived. Of course. Uh, you know, and, and this just goes to show you that the disciples often are, are still too far below the teacher. Yeah. But so I think, you know, a nice conclusion of, of Laszlo's uh, discussion today and the issues at hand that we're facing, as I said, we need to be willing to go through some discomfort. But what stops people from the discomfort of change is that they actually believe that they're in love with what they have. Yeah. Right? So there's an it. Yep. So really what we're suffering from right now, in a very true way, in my opinion, is that we all have a lot of addictions that we're not willing to let go of. Yeah. But what are addictions? They're attempts at safe love. Yeah. People need addictions to give them a sense of something they can engage with, often that changes their state because they're not living in ways that create happiness and wholeness within them. Mm. So you get addicted to alcohol or you get addicted to drugs or pain medications that allow you to disengage from the pain of the choices that you've made for better or worse. And we're very, very addicted to things that so-called make our life easier. Yeah. But the truth is it's not making our life easier yeah. at all. In fact, it's leading us to ill health, sedentary living, um, you know, not, I mean, I'll give you an example of how far we've gotten from understanding. Mm. I was coaching a client the other day whose house is on the beach in Malibu. Mm. Now, if you're listening to this, don't. I'm not trying to pick on you, but it was, you have to admit, if you're listening, that it was pretty interesting. Hmm. And I said to him, you know, I was talking to him about, um, I can't remember why I was telling him, but I said, you know, when you do this, face west. Hmm. And he said, what direction is that? Hmm. I said, look out the window of your house. You're on the west coast. Hmm. You're on the Pacific Ocean. Hmm. West is facing the ocean. <laughs> and he goes, oh my God, you know, he says, I don't remember how to figure that out. Yeah. Well, you know, in all fairness, how many people do you think if you walk through a shopping mall and said, which direction's north, south, east, or west right now could tell you? Mm. How many people could even get, begin to have yeah. a clue of how to find water out in nature or how to hunt or yeah. how to fish or how to plant or how to yeah. harvest? I mean, we're in a situation right now where People really don't know the basics of how to live, and they're addicted to technologies that take away the responsibilities yeah. of the foundation principles that create life. And that is a symptom of how far we've disconnected ourselves from nature. Yeah. And when you get that much disassociation between you and what supports you, then you're unconscious about when you're destroying the very ground you're standing on. Yeah. So I will close my point by making a statement from the aboriginals the aboriginal people have a saying when a man's mind and body do not stand in the same place he is crooked hmm. and right now we're very crooked because our minds are in love with things that are not supported by what we're standing on or hmm. don't support what we're standing on and I'd like to say thank you to Irvin Laszlo for enlightening us and inspiring us to know that the 2% of us that do have the wisdom to see are enough to make a change. And I would also like to reiterate that he says when a system's unstable is the best time to change it yeah. because you can, it, it's already moving, it's falling, right? So yeah. it's easy to redirect someone that's falling. Anybody in martial arts knows that. Mm. So if we take the advantage to, support it as it falls, but do the work to create something to put in its place that's more sustainable, mm. I think we're going to be okay. Yeah. I think it'll be a great opportunity. Yeah. And it sounds like Laszlo believes quite clearly that he, the, the other 98% have, have the universe within them, have the cosmos within them, and that cosmos is evolving toward unity. So yeah. um, there's all the makings in the other 98% to make the right decisions and to to head in that uh, make a change yes 
hey, I really enjoyed sharing this experience with you, James. Thanks. It's fun to yeah. do something together. It's been a while since you and I did a project like this together. And, yeah. and so um, thank you to all of you for listening. If you enjoyed our conversation and the wisdom of Urban Laszlo, please share it as widely as possible. I don't think yeah. I need to tell you how important it is. Yeah. And if you have questions you'd like to ask on an upcoming Q&A with Paul, um, James, do you know what the email address for the Q&A questions is? Um, they can send it to podcast at checkinstitute.com. Oh, podcast at checkinstitute.com. Yep. There you go. And uh, thank you for, for everything. And now let's hear a little bit from Irvin Laszlo about how to where to find his resources, website, and books. And believe me, he's written, I think, 25 books. And I've read probably a dozen of them. Yeah. And uh, they're absolutely excellent. So if you've never read an Irvin Laszlo book, you have lots of options. But his new book, which is coming out any day now, um, let's see, I forgot, that. Reconnecting to Source. I, I've got it and I've read a bunch of sections of it. It's absolutely beautiful. It's coming out March the 24th, which is pretty cool because we yeah. were holding off on this interview, yeah. which was quite a while before the coronavirus thing hit. Yeah. And now it's probably going to come out right when his new book comes out. Yeah, And what a great offering for everybody because the book is yeah. absolutely beautiful. Like you said, there's like 19 experts in there sharing their opinions. And, you know, Irvin Laszlo travels in yeah. very wise company. Yeah, um, I've got some of his books with other authors and they're fantastic. So, yeah. hey, lots of love, you guys. Let's, uh, let's get our heads together and let's get our hearts together. And let's all stand on the earth together and uh, let's really ask her what she needs and be brave enough to take care of our mama for a while. She's given us her heart and soul. I think now it's time for us to give her something back and uh, everything we give back to her ultimately just creates more safety and security for us as well. So it's the, it's a circular gift, you know, yeah. and you know, love is a boomerang. So if we can start loving each other more and loving the planet more and solving the challenges we have, we'll all grow and we'll reach true evolution where there's no it you love because you realize there is no God but God. So we worship everything and everyone. Oh, great spirit. Oh, thanks, thanks for, for having me, Paul. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, everybody. Yep. Bye. Where can people find, I, I, I understand from your publicist, you're launching a new website or program of some type. So where can people find whatever you'd like to offer at this time? I know all your books are available on Amazon for anybody that's interested and in, uh, the spelling of Irvin's last name is L A S Z L O E R V I N Laszlo. Uh, what would what would you like to offer to direct people wherever you'd like to direct them to get more information about your work or whatever you're offering? The simplest thing is just to open your browsers and put in my name. You'll find a lot of lot of different uh, uh, alternatives to access more information, including a lot of different videos on YouTube. I have an institute which is called the Laszlo Institute of New Paradigm Research. It has its own website. And so I think if you just look for look for me, you'll find information, maybe more than you wanted to originally. <laughs> well, it's all fantastic. I've spent a lot of hours reading your books and watching documentaries with you in them. And your, your Gaia series was awesome. And Irvin, I must say from the bottom of my heart, I am deeply, deeply grateful for you and all your work and all the gifts you've brought to the world. And it's been something very special in my life just to be able to hear your voice personally and share you with as many people as possible. So thank you for everything that you do every day, have done. And when I pass from the physical plane, I'm going to come find you to give you a big hug and rub your feet. Yeah, I'd like to find you in the same, <laughs> the same way. Yes. Thank you. As we can get together. Yes, it's, well, it's to me, it's a great sense of satisfaction and comfort to know that there are people like you, perhaps not many, but there are a few people, and you are a key person among them. And it's wonderful to know that you are, and that we can talk together and perhaps develop and share our ideas. Thank you very much. Well, lots of love and blessings to all of you listening. Please look into... Irvin Laszlo's work. Look at his new book. As soon as it comes out, you can probably do an advanced purchase on Amazon, Reconnecting to the Source, The New Science of Spiritual Experiences, How It Can Change You, and How It Can Transform the World. I can't recommend it enough. I was blessed to have a, a pre-published copy, and it's absolutely excellent. So lots of love, many blessings. If you like the podcast, please share it with everybody. 
and uh, let's work together and inspire each other to do the things we need to do to take care of each other and Mother Earth. See you next time. Thank you for listening to Living 4D with Paul Check and today's guest, Professor Irvin Laszlo. His latest book, Reconnecting to the Source, The New Science of Spiritual Experience, How It Can Change You and How It Can Transform the World, is available on Amazon and all good bookstores. You can follow Professor Laszlo on Twitter at Irvin Laszlo or contact him via his website at irvinlaszlo.com. Follow Paul on Instagram and Twitter at Living4D Podcast or on his YouTube podcast channel, youtube.com forward slash Living4D with Paul Check. You can watch more on Paul's blog at paulchecksblog.com and the Czech Institute's brand new streaming media site, chekiva.com.